doing? Tasting, tasting, one, two, three. From MacArthur Park, where it's still melting in the dark. Carmen Town is now in session. Spencer Crittenden, would you please join us on stage, the Game Master extraordinaire. <laughs> and let's bring out the mayor of Harmontown, Dan Harmon. in a sprinkler shape like a clown she got wet i laid down a hundred dollar bet that she couldn't swim in the water coming out the fuck her so hard in the mouth okay gross gross okay stop we go until we get gross that's the new rule i like that did like, you win like, the bet uh yes oh okay yeah, yeah. Uh, also, who, who was the other person on the other end I of that one hundred dollar bet? Uh, you know, uh, you, you, I have all the same questions you do. <laughs> uh, I I only have one item in my notepad. Oh uh, yeah, but we've got a great guest who's very provocative and, and and wonderful to talk to. So you don't want me to have more in my notepad. But I, I already texted Jeff about this today. Look, I, okay, I, I, we have we have. To, there's so many questions I have about this. There's so. But you know, I texted you his whole monologue, so don't. Right. So you know, you know to let me get I, to I, the all the way to the I, end, I and then to, we can I, all discuss. I, I want you to lay it down as you found it. Right. Like, like, like the, the so plan. I I will admit, and I don't do this all the time. It was just kind of a weird impulse I had. Like life's going good, and I left my new home. And I knew the work I had to do. I knew how long I had to do it. And I was kind of like, I, just, I was like, I'm going to stop at this bar. And it's 11.30 a.m. And I'm going to have one before work. And I'm not usually that guy. And, and I name, don't judge those guys. Your, your name was Cliff Clavin. And, and I wouldn't be embarrassed if I was that guy. But I was like, I'm going to give this a try. And also, I'm in a new neighborhood. So I wanted to see what is the new neighborhood's bar like at 11.30 a.m.? Well, I'm not going back because it's fucking packed. It's like a Friday night for them because it's a different, it's not, the drawing room is, I'm really learning is something incredibly special. Um, so I'll probably be making the trek to continue to drink there um, when I'm in that day drinking mood because this, this was like a TGI Fridays. But there was this guy, well, I had my one drink I just, I just eavesdropped and, and I heard a monologue from a guy that made me finish my drink very quickly, settle up in cash, and fast walk to my car so I could finish transcribing it without and, him knowing I was writing and, and down everything. And you sent me and Dino a group text. Right. Yeah. And we had a conversation about it, which, which I'm glad for, because it was kind of like prep for the... Because you would be cutting me off every five words if I just read this. You'd be like, wait a minute. But this is what I, I texted my two friends. Uh, <laughs> Dan uh, has two friends. <laughs> I, I just I just ran out to the car and I was like I, so so I did I didn't stand a chance of not getting this all verbatim. Now I am going to do this in his authentic patois. He was a six foot five ish African American man. Um, who so I'm gonna you know it wasn't like it just like yeah I look it, <laughs> if if we've learned nothing else this week we've learned to ask what's racist. But but I just I just want to be authentic because it's more the working class nature of his ranch. You, you're you're doing a. I'm not going to pretend he's from Jersey. Right. I don't think it's important. It's like, it's, I, and, but I'm not going to be like the crows in Dumbo. I'm not doing a thing. <laughs> I don't think it's funny that he's the, the talks the way he does. I just right. like I, I just want you to understand like like this is a this is a working class monologue from a very specific archetype. Um, <clears throat> so what age are we talking? I would put him at 55, 60. 55, six foot four black gentleman, and he is at the bar next to you. He was holding court for sure. And uh, I could tell you some politically incriminating shit that he said before this, but I don't want you to, I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna put him in one category or another. Right. I just found this monologue so fucking fascinating in a vacuum. 
I think just start with the with narrative, and then we can go yeah. back to that if we need to. Okay, so I'm going to try to do this very tastefully. <clears throat> but I'm is, also going to try to do it authentically. Every, <laughs> which is how every tasteful story starts. I'm going to try to be tasteful. Okay. Lou Diamond Phillips, okay? Lou Diamond Phillips. He parked three feet from the curb. You know what I'm saying? 36 inches. So I'm writing the ticket. And he comes out, what are you doing? Why are you giving me a ticket? I said, sir, the law is your car needs to be a minimum of 18 inches from the curb. He says, oh, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. You know, so I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. You can take the ticket or I can call a tow truck. And you know it's going to be much more expensive. And then his wife comes out. and She was much more subtle, more kind. So I eventually said, okay, I'm not going to call the tow truck because I like Lou Diamond Phillips. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like his movies. But he came out like an asshole. <laughs> and all I'm saying is, so what makes his job more exalted than mine? He can do his job, but I can't do mine. Why is that? And I ran from the bar. <laughs> I, after waiting, I was going to wait. I was, I was like, like, I'm like thumbnailing notes, but I was like, he quieted, he simmered down because, because the people he was holding court with, they were all like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, Todd. Like, you, so you, like you're fun to listen to, but I don't know what you want us to say. <laughs> Is he, is he the hero of that story? Or for him, he, he certainly is. I, I think he's the absolute villain, which is interesting about the conversation you and I had. I, do, I, I absolutely 100% side with Lou Diamond Phillips in this story. I would first answer this man's question, not that I would have wanted any beef with him, I, I, but I, I'm like, the answer to his rhetorical question is, the reason Lou Diamond Phillips can do his job and you can't do yours is because his job is to make people happy and yours is to make people sad. <laughs> and that's no, no fault of yours, but not accepting that is weird. But, but the, Why does Lou Diamond Phillips get to be celebrated? He's a celebrity. Was, it, was there no contrition on Lou Diamond Phillips' part about parking a, a foot farther away from the curb than well, you're supposed I to? Well, I mean, this, this is the only narrative you're going to get. Lou Diamond, here's the quotes from yeah, Lou Diamond Phillips. he said it's Phillips. bullshit. It's bullshit! I don't know. You know, and then he heard the reason. He's like, nah, it's bullshit. You know, that's what we got. And we know his wife was very supple and smooth. And, you know, he, he, she got him out of the tow truck. But it sounds like Lou Diamond Phillips, like any person that parks three feet from the curb, which I do want to be a law, because that's all, that is 36 inches, and that is extreme. Um, it sounds like he had to pay the same ticket that a garbage man or, or a parking enforcement officer off-duty would have to pay. It doesn't <laughs> sound like he actually got away with anything. It, in fact, kind of sounds, from my perspective, assuming this was 20 years ago, or this guy is the biggest Lou Diamond Phillips fan in the world, um, that the only difference between Lou Diamond Phillips and a parking enforcement officer is that, Lou, or, or a normal person getting a parking ticket, is that because he's famous, this guy has been telling this story for 20 years, uh, whereas I, otherwise I, it wouldn't I, have been I, a big deal. I, I hope it was like yesterday or within the last week. It, it, it has to be recent. Then right? that guy's got to be... I, and, here, and here's my one other thought about also, answering it, his rhetorical question. The other reason he can do his job and you can't do yours is because God gave you and Lou Diamond Phillips both one chance at coping with Lou Diamond Phillips' fame and you're blowing it. And Lou Diamond Phillips has made a lot of movies that I know you haven't seen. You didn't see Bats in the theater. I did. I know Lou Diamond Phillips is good. Yeah. Have you guys a seen every Bats? Everybody right now, name, in, in your mind, name four Lou Diamond Phillips films. And, and you only get one Young Guns. I actually forgot Young Guns. And I was like, for sure La Bamba. He must be thinking about La Bamba. And, but you pointed out, you, you had a very good point, like Young Guns, like your, your theory on it was he went into law enforcement because of Young Guns. Yeah, b because Lou Diamond Phillips is, the, is his, like, the reason why he started to go into uh, law enforcement is because Lou Diamond Phillips, who is the, 
the kind of representative of stoic morality. And then he meets Lou Diamond Phillips, who's parked too far away He's like, away I wanted to curb. be the young gun of parking enforcement or right. the LAPD. I don't know. No, he wanted to be in the FBI. He wanted to be in another thing. You, you don't go into parking enforcement because that was your end game. That, that was your thing. I just wonder how many, how many people weren't assholes that come across him doing his job. I mean, it is... His job is to really rain on a, people's parade, is, and that's what, what, what if, not his fault. But it's what, a, what if Lou Diamond Bamba was just on a bad day? I call him Lou Diamond Bamba because there was an MTV interview. So it goes uh, on MTV like a long time ago. Somebody, what's the worst soundtrack you ever heard? And he goes, "Is that no, no, no? What's the worst moment in movie history?" And they asked a guy in New York who was like from Brooklyn. And he goes. It's when that Lou Diamond Bomba comes out and it goes, you know what? You're all right. <laughs> but he called him Lou Diamond Bomba. That was one other thought I had as I got to the car. I was like, wait a minute. Like, you never changed your middle name to parking enforcement, I bet. That's a safe bet. Obviously, at some point, Lou Diamond Phillips or his parents decided he was destined for success. But, but is, is the story of, of the thing that you ever heard, there was a guy at a bar talking about being a parking enforcement official and Lou Diamond Bamba was being an asshole. Was Lou Diamond Bamba on a bad day? Or, or, or was... Or, well, are, yeah, it, I don't know. You know. That's a question for him, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, who knows? Why, why, when do you park three feet from a curb? Is it because you think that's within your, your right to do so? Or is it because he was with his wife? Maybe she was... I mean, we don't know. They could have been outside a hospital. I'm not trying to... But then you said the guy was... Victim uh, uh, blame. <laughs> then you said the victim being a guy who didn't enjoy writing a ticket. But the guy was at the bar. That, then he was watching TV, and he, he called women bitches for... Like, yeah, I mean, it. that's what I'm saying. Like, I already knew the guy was like... It, it, it's a thing. It's like... I I I interpreted everything he was saying as like a projection of, you know, this is a, this is the thing. It's like like people thinking. This is why I tend to side with the celebrities. I tend to side with the publicly shamed. I tend to side with the visible because I think that people tend to project onto luminaries um, this like privilege that may be partially true. I mean, let's, I'm not being like a fucking pure apologist and going, Oh boy, the, the actors go to their job and they just work so hard. Like it's, it's harder than coal mining. I'm, I'm not implying that. I will say it's a very hard fucking job. I should know. I have fucking worked actors very hard. Um, I've driven them to the brink. And then I've said with a Kubrickian flair, great. Now put film in the camera. Because I needed that from Danny Pudi in that moment. And you loved it, and that's why you're here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I know somebody that ran into Keanu Reeves on a bad day, and Keanu Reeves was being like surly. And he's like, fuck Keanu Reeves. He was a fucking asshole. You ask anybody else, Keanu Reeves, super cool. But you, you, you can't get one pass if you're a famous person because if, if, if you have a bad moment with somebody, then yeah, that's I, your I just, thing. I just kind of bristle at that culture of like, oh, it's that, it's that Dire Straits video refrigerator guy. Like, like, hey, look at that faggot. He's got his own airplane. Hey, he must be doing something right. And it's like, because, because, because in that monologue, the guy says, and I like... Di why, why, what do you mean you like Lou Diamond Phillips? Why don't you hate him now? Is it because you think that... I mean, it, it, obviously you believe that he won the lottery. He didn't earn anything. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking the question, why is his job so much more exalted? You, you're implying that he's the re recipient of pure, undeserved privilege at the same time as you're saying, like, and I like him. That's the thing, which is a very familiar thing to me. It rings this bell in me where I'm like, ugh. You know, every interaction you have with somebody who's just a little bit off in there, like, like, oh, your girlfriend's tits or whatever, and you go, like, hey, go, why don't you go fuck yourself? And they're like, I'm kidding. 
I'm kidding. You write Rick and Morty. Why don't you fucking learn? You're rich. Don't you, aren't you swimming in a pool full of money? Why don't you fucking, like, you should learn to take a joke. And it's like, there's something off here with this relationship. And it's coming from a projection on the part of someone who's asking themselves, what would I do if I were Keanu Reeves? And if their answer is dark enough, Keanu Reeves is guilty of those crimes. And I think that's, like, a very uh, do, fundamentally do you, can you, wrong. Can you conjure up uh, a memory of when you think that you you might have misbehaved and that's going to color somebody's memory of Oh, Dan I'm sure it's all the time. I mean, as, 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 mu as much as I love it when people uh, interact with me, I don't, I don't, I, I, what, what can I, what can I ever do? I mean, I, like, 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 I'm not a good person. I'm not a, I'm not a pleasant person to be around. So I'm not, I'm also not an actor. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I never consider it my job to be like publicly uh, fucking, Digestible. No, but you you are like like you you. I'm not sufficient for that, but thank you. No, I'm just saying like I, I, if if somebody if so, if so, if, so, if somebody were to know who I was and <laughs> if somebody were to know who I was and on top of that by whatever like coincidence their fault or not their fault like I'm not getting. Uh, uh, perfect, like fucking, like I didn't get a drink for an hour or whatever. I don't know. Like they well, might it was a, a real story trip, about like, something uh, I said that was kind of like dickish. Spencer, when we did the uh, the Harmon tour, like a documentary thing, we watched you go through your first like on camera, like I am a person that people want to meet, and you were kind of mistrustful or like go going through the scrutiny of strangers liking you for either some reason or no reason or whatever. Yeah. That's right, Jeff. Um, we'll be right back. <laughs> I remember, like, one of the worst, like, there's this story where we were doing the upfronts. Like, w remember when we did the CISO thing at New York or whatever? When we, it was that terrible, terrible. We, <laughs> like, played with the love makers or whatever. Um, we, we did, like, a, a test of Harmon Quest or something. It was a fucking nightmare. Um, afterwards, there was someone who was backstage that was, like, I guess a fan or something that, um, that was like, hey, great show. And I was like, that's like literally the worst experience, the worst show I've ever done. And like, I just remember like giving that guy like the cold shoulder and like, I just carried that with me. I'm like, you can't treat people like that. You can't like talk to fans. Yeah. I wasn't like, you know, go fuck yourself or whatever. But I think that if someone had that interaction, they would be all like, oh, that was kind of a bummer, you know? And so like kind of anytime I interact with fans, I think of that and it's like, well, I never want to do that again. And uh, you know what? I found out pretty recently that that fan wasn't a fan at all. It was Tom Sharpling. <laughs> and so I feel really, really shitty about wait, it now. Wait, wait, who's that? Oh, I thought you'd feel better. Cause no, because like that's like, I don't know. That's like if you were like, oh, and it turned out I like mouthed off to, you know, Keanu Reeves or something. It's oh, because like, you were. And, and, and when you say not a fan, you don't mean dislikes the. No, but the, it, I just thought it was some not random an ordinary fan, fan but yeah. then someone also that you would admire and whose opinion would matter a lot to you. And right. You or just, I just, it's, it's, it's like if one person just had one bad interaction with me and it just, you know, they told that story, that's one thing. But if it's like, oh, there's this guy who could potentially, yeah. you know, talk about me to in circles or something. Like, I, I learned a long time ago, like, when, like you walk off stage and you have. Uh, you thought you had a shitty show. Oh, I did. A and then, and then somebody comes up to you and goes, "I loved that show." You, you really shouldn't say, "No, that show sucked." You're wrong. Uh, you, you just say, "Thank you," a and because the, if they had a good time, the, like the, the, but what if they're lying? <laughs> well, 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 if they walk up and say that, then they're a liar. But if, if they're saying that and they mean it. Like you, you just walk away and say thank you. But I also think you, 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 you yeah, you you never deflect a compliment. Like which means just like B you're wrong. What you just said is wrong. You have bad taste in experiences and yes. people. Um, <laughs> it, but you don't. The, you don't have to do the opposite of that, which is like for me. Oh my God, thank you. Um, you could. You, I I've come to go. I I was told to stop doing that, and I went from doing that to just going like. Thank you so much. That's really nice of you to say. I thought I did horribly. So, so that's great that you're shows. helping me by feeling that way. And then they'll go, no, I thought it was great. I was like, well, geez, maybe it was great. Thank you for saying that. You're helping me out. So, yeah, so, some of the worst shows I've ever done got the most praise, and I don't know why people said that. But Oh, because they're idiots. But, they don't know. Right. <laughs> oh, they get off their tractors, and they're like, yippee-de-doopa-doo. Uh, I'm going to go see a famous person. 
Oh boy, I bet they're nailing it. I wouldn't know. I got a marble for a brain. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> that's what that guy thinks Lou Diamond Phillips thinks when he gets in his car. He thinks that's why Lou Diamond Phillips parked that far from the curb. He's like, who's going to give me a ticket? Some marble brain? But I was in Young Guns. That's not what Lou Diamond Phillips was thinking. And, and you said to me in the text, because you, you were inflamed about this, you said... I wasn't inflamed. I was, no, no, I was I mean, having fun yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, you were, taking Lou Diamond Phillips' side. You were excited, and, and you said, like, uh, ask that guy to name two other movies beside La Bamba and, uh, 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 that Lou Diamond Phillips was in. He, he wouldn't be able to do it. Right. He, he, he might have got two. But he, I actually he, forgot Young Guns, which is interesting. <laughs> Because well, the, and it makes you realize. Because I was, I was actually thinking of Lou Diamond Phillips, Young like kind of like La Bamba, and then like made the most of like like been in a been in a dozen movies that are just hard to recall, like 1997's Bats, which is fucking amazing, and he's great in it. That's peak Phillips. <laughs> See Bats, also it's a horror if, movie. If, if you would have dared that Boy, guy to make two more movies movie. beside La Bamba, he could have gone Young Guns and Young Guns Two, and you would have been out a hundred bucks. All right, our next guest. <laughs> Uh, what, what if it was Lou Diamond Phillips? Our guest, See, if, uh, if, if, we were, uh, if we were a proper podcast, I know. this whole thing would have been a tee-up to yeah. bring out Lou Diamond Bamba and the whole crowd would have gone fucking If berserk. I deserved my podcast pulpit, I would also have the parking enforcement guy out and I would do some real fucking work, like the guy that does... <laughs> You know, heavyweight for uh, Gimlet Media. Like, I, 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 I'm like, 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 there's people out there doing real work. I don't know why I continue to we occupy get, space. I, I think we have the juice to get Lou Diamond Phillips on the show. Well, don't insult him. No, I, I, or you won't I, get I, him on. I'm not. I'm insulting our audience. <laughs> All right, so our, our guest tonight has been a guest before. I believe he was a guest last it time. It better the be Lou Diamond there, fucking Phillips. There, there really wasn't an audience, but I got to say... I, if, if, if I had to name three man crush uh, occupations, like there was, the, there was the guy I met who was an Irish firefighter. Who I'm like, geez, they fight that too. Um, it's a little racist, but I used to think I was Irish before it's, I sent my spit into a I'm, fucking I'm pre- computer. I'm pretty sure that's the definition of racism. I still, though, for all I knew, you, I was Irish. You, you don't think other cultures fight fires? I just look when I when I when I engage in the stereotype of, of Irish, the Irish being fighty. I, yeah. I, I I mean, it's the same as them being poets oh, and singers. I, I'm think? like, oh, I got hearts in my eyes. I want to be Irish so bad. And then to be a firefighter, an Irish firefighter, I'm just saying. In in your mind, you think Irish, like like, it's the little leprechaun guy actually like No, I think it's a a fucking badass dude that's like, oh, well, you think you love me, but you don't. Get up off the floor now. I'm going to sing a song with me fists. They're beautiful people. They're supernatural. Their their cereal has uh, uh, No, stop it. See, that shit's offensive. But anyways, can we please, our guest is waiting in the wings. This right. is the, I don't know what the third man crush occupation would be, but as far as two word occupations, this is right there. Who knows if it's number one After or number Irish two. After Irish fire, firefighter. Or it, before, I'm not sure. Please welcome conflict journalist. <laughs> Fucking come on. Put your dicks down and lift your pants back up for Rob Evans. Rob Evans. What up, Rob? Well, Dan answered my question as to whether or not I was going to try a really offensive Irish accent as soon as I got out on stage. So I don't have to now. Thank you for that. Have you awesome. been? Have you been to Ireland and your oh, conflict yeah. journaling? No. no Seen any fires? Oh, okay. Awesome. No. Fires? No. No. No See? fires. I didn't think so. Are you ethnically descended from the Irish people? Not at all, but I can sing every word of "Come Out You Black and Tans." Whoa! So if you want Good to get a couple more drinks, let's hear it. Us. Let's hear it. <laughs> uh oh. Do, do you do you really want to sing with him? He what, does, what, what, but don't what, take that as. What's any. the song? It's "Come Out You Black and Tans." It's an old IRA song about beating up British paramilitaries in the streets of Dublin. Give us the first refrain of that. Come out, you black and tans. Come out and fight me like a man. Show your wife how you won medals out in Flanders. Tell her how the IRA made you run like hell away from the green and lovely lakes of Kiloshandril. 
Wow. Damn. So the first couple of rhymes, you're thinking, oh, shit, this is racist. Mm. And then you're like, oh, no, he likes the black and tans. <laughs> no. What? No. Well, no, is it? He wants to fight him. <laughs> no, is it? I thought he admired them and wanted no, them to fight w- with he, him. He wants to beat the he shit out He wants to beat up He's the black and tans. It's, it's a drunken me. Irish militant being like, oh, you won w- medals in World War I, you fucking ponce. Come out and fight me. I'll beat you up. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's what the song is but about. But is the black and tans he hates it's, veterans? It's referencing a uniform, not a skin. It is a uniform. Yeah. Not a skin color. No, 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 no. Not a skin color. Everyone was very white. Right. So it's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you, when you grow up in a country like Ireland, you have to... It's like, the, the pigmentation of your clothes has got me in a fucking xenophobic rage. <laughs> they did kind of invent that, right? It's like, is that an orange band around your arm? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry if you're Irish. Do not attack. Um, <laughs> these people can beat up fire. I do not want to cross them, um, but um, so it, it, you 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 go everywhere uh, wh- where I I would never want to cross. Um, you just got back from Syria by mm-hmm. way of Mexico, or no, no, I was just there for a, a wedding. You went Afterwards. to oh Mexico Afterwards. was a wedding. Yeah, yeah, that was just for fun. Yeah. Syria was for work. Yeah, and, and we I went was, in by Iraq. Yeah. And, and, and you gave me a little uh, a little a little uh, thumbnail of what you were doing out there, which I thought was really interesting. The the precursor being that you you're kind of a you're 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 freelance, right? Because you don't like you said the big news news organizations they don't send you to to yeah. uh, the Middle East unless you're going to do a story that fits in a. You're doing you're doing ISIS stories. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to get like it's hard to get a big paper to pay for you to go out to Syria because it's very expensive. They usually want you to travel with like security, which kind of bollocks everything up. They I imagine they have to insure to... the hell out of you. It, yeah, like a, an, a, it can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars pretty easily for like even just a single reporter in there for a couple of weeks. So, so um, you're, you're freelancing and you're selling your stories to d- different media outlets, or I don't have to do that anymore. So I got I, I do a couple of podcasts for um, iHeart radio behind the bastards is like the big one and so like that's my regular job i got i got the one fan whistling somewhere <laughs> and these are the um, these are the stuff 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 yeah, that, yeah. How, how stuff gets made stuff they don't yeah, want you they to know they got acquired by a series of companies and that's the way things work i yeah. guess um are, are you a print or a photo or both i do print and i do uh podcasts like online and stuff um so like the i i just raised a bunch of money from my fans i just asked people like i said i'll write this audio book about how right-wing terrorism works in the United States, and this sort of plot started in the 1980s um, to create like a network of stochastic, randomly organized terrorists to carry out attacks to destabilize the country, how this all like came together. And I'll write that, and I'll put it out for you if you guys raise a bunch of money for me so that I can go to Syria and Crowd-sourced journalism. Yeah. By gum. What, what, what it, brand of gum? It's 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 but it's both an amazing thing and also a sad testament to our yeah. to the state of journalism. Quit dodging the question. Well, what are you gonna do? <laughs> what brand of gum? It had better fucking be Big League Chew. Yeah. Big um, League Chew. You're damn right, Big League Chew. Okay, That's so be the so was gum. this a crowdsourced affair? The, like what you were the yeah. story you were doing out there? So tell yeah. us about this. This is this is like okay. <sighs> So this is like, there's a complicated story and it's hard to tell like how far back to go when trying to explain this. Like the short, if I'm like pitching this on an elevator is there's like a quasi anarchist feminist revolution in Northern Syria and they're sort of the folks who did most of the fighting to beat ISIS. Um, And so we were hanging out with these people and like talking with them about how their system works and like watching this sort of thing develop um and that's like the 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 short pitch and when you say anarchist you mean like like proper old school like like like, like pol- no political anarchism like not 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 anarchic where, where people think that word doesn't mean anything this is where we get into the longer explanation of it and the longer explanation is that there is this turkish kurdish terrorist named abdullah ajalan who is like a, an a- absolutely a terrorist killed a shitload of innocent people back in the day and then in the late 90s he gets arrested by the united states um in i think kenya and a couple of, there was another country involved too anyway he's been on an island prison in turkey this whole time like for the last 20 years or so and in the last 20 years he's sort of like moderated and he's just done a bunch of reading and he came upon an American anarchist philosopher named Murray Bookchin and he started writing stuff where he's like oh shit I was wrong number one I was wrong to be a Marxist-Leninist number two uh, the kind of terrorism I was advocating isn't okay and if we're going to actually reform society in a way 
that fixes things like I wanted to fix them, rather than just trying to overthrow the government and institute our own, we need to actually overthrow the systems of oppression that are at the basis of all authoritarianism, which is the domination of women by men. And so we need to fundamentally reorganize society oh, in order to shit. fix the gender imbalance if we're going to fix anything. What? Wow. And due to a series of like weird flukes of history, the terrorist group that this guy is the figurehead of wound up being the most powerful force in northern Syria when ISIS was on the march. And they formed a couple of little subsidiary groups that then took on a life of their own and got US air support and backing and they beat ISIS and now they're in control of a region of about four million people. And so for the last couple of years that there's been like, okay, well we have all of this political theory this guy's been writing and now we're in charge, we should see if it works. Right. And it kind of seems like it does. An, a kind well, of anarchic. Are, are, are they being are they being like proper anarchists like like Paris Commune and like Mikhail Bakunin and Kropotkin and Emma Goldman and all that? Or, I would I would call them anarchist inspired in certain areas. Another way I've heard it, I just a journalist today was telling me he he thinks it's um, his opinion of Rojava, which is what the region is called, is the um, the world's most effective direct democracy governed by an authoritarian system. Oh, in shit. Which, so you've got the military, right. which is central in a lot of aspects because they need to defend this region both from the Assad regime, which are assholes, um, and from the Turkish government, which are also not very nice, particularly since it's a Kurdish-led liberation yes. struggle. No, not at all. Um, so they're in charge of a significant amount of what goes on there, but not on the civil side of but things. Are they anarchists in the proper sense of where, where like, it's really <clears throat> like, a, like a true uh, democratic, like, like anti-rule, where every, everybody like, c c decides their own fate and stuff like that? Somewhat. There's a lot of that in there. So it's bottom-up political organization. And so they have communes on like the lower level of thing where like different neighborhoods, every neighborhood will elect, like have sort of a direct democracy where they vote for representatives of the neighborhood, which represent them at like the city level, which represents the city at like the canton level, which is roughly analogous to a state. And like it builds up from there. One of the rules they have is that when they elect representatives, they never just elect one representative. So you don't just have a president in charge of food production. You have two presidents, and they're always a man and a woman. And the idea is that you should never have just a man or just a woman in charge of anything. It should be both simultaneously. And they have to come to an accord personally about what they're going to do before anything can be done. And this is law throughout? Yeah, Rojava. Wow. About four million people living under this right now. Yeah. And, and, and uh, historically what's going to happen is that both other sides uh, are going to yeah. come back in and absolutely squash them because they don't... Yeah. The, 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 if the, the threat of actual democracy breaks out, they get murdered. They, they, they get absolutely hammered. And it's you can see that in the offing all around it. So most of where we were was within a mile or two of the Turkish border. Like I had cell reception through Turkish cell networks the whole time I was there. And you can see the military forces there, the YPG and the YTBJ, are building hundreds of miles of tunnels underneath everything because they're just waiting for the Turkish uh, forces to invade. And there's this gigantic border wall that the Turks have built that's like 20 feet tall and topped with concertina wire and guard towers behind it. And like every day we were there, the president of Turkey would send out another threat saying like, I'm going to wipe these people out. Like if we don't get this exclusion zone we want, if the US doesn't pull back, I'm just going to invade and like we'll see what happens. And he's been throwing threats out that, like that out for a while. And the Assad regime is still in control of most of Syria at this point. And like, to the extent that there's one city where they share joint control of, and we were like three feet away from the Assad regime, and there's like statues of Bashar al-Assad and his troops glowering at you on one side, and then there's like the, the YPG on the other side, and it's very tense in some places. But then you'd travel like five miles back and you'd be like sitting at this like local council meeting where it's just like a bunch of old women in their 60s and 70s talking about how they're handling like, they don't have cops to deal with stuff like domestic disturbances and like that sort of thing. Like civil law enforcement is all done by an elected commune of like people in the town who just like go door to door right. and there's like a fight or something. And that's and your like anarchy council it out. functionally. Because yeah. it's because people need not be governed necessarily. They can figure shit out. They're kind of designed for it. They're There's usually a better at it. Yeah. Um, I, 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 got a, I got a bookmark that it, it, it's amazing to me how some thoughts are have so much power because this guy who was a warlord, autocratic, yeah, terrorist-minded sure. guy sure. spent time in prison and then had that realization is like reaching me who's like, 
a renowned woke Westerner, um, like, like where I'm going, like, holy shit, yeah, that's a that's a really good fundamental point that misogyny is the atomic unit mm -hmm. of autocracy. Yeah. Like that's what he's saying is like you can't go into an honest conversation about whether or not mankind need be governed um, when you're walking into when you're that, governing half of the species. When you're, when yeah. you're, yeah, when you are socialized to like get enervated by any mm -hmm. discussion that you think is not political about whether or not Becky should be acting the way she's acting. One of the really interesting things out there, because we talked to hundreds and hundreds of people, um, and we spent time at a military training base for the, the YPJ, which is the all-women's militia. So all of society all, in Rojava. All, all women's militia. All women's. In, in Syria. I've, I've got some pictures, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so all of society, there's two chunks. There's general society, which is male and female, and should be as close to a 50-50 mix as possible. That's the goal. And then there's usually a woman's auxiliary because they understand that like, this is fucking Syria. Like shit's been really rough for women here for a long time and we need all women's groups so that these like member, like women who've been members of tribes where like there hasn't been any representation of women for a very long time can kind of learn the ropes of speaking for themselves without having to be like making decisions in the same room as some like older man who's just gonna kind of walk all over them. Um, so you, you, have an, you have an all female uh, auxiliary army? Yeah, you want to see pictures? Yes. Okay, let's see. I got it on the back here. I mean, oh, like, wow. yeah, we have to have conversations in, uh, outside of writers' rooms about how being it, conscious of like like women being socialized mm -hmm. to bear interruption more than men are socialized to not interrupt. And yeah. like, I can't even begin to. Um, that's we, that, that's in a rich first world empire. I had a weird experience sitting on the floor drinking coffee with these young women, talking about how they have to avoid fake male feminists, and how like, yeah, there's guys in here that will say all the right things when you interview them, he's and will sitting say they right next to you. <laughs> he's sitting right next to you. We, we call it virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. that, like, they didn't use that word, but they were like, a lot of these guys, they talk the talk, but like, you know that they don't really believe, and if things were to change society, societally, they would go back to the way things were. Wow. And my fixer, who's this wonderful woman, Chabat, she, one of the most incredible people I've ever met. Um, when you say fixer, you mean what? A fixer is the person who leads you around. They usually interpret, they translate, they get you access. Do you, do you speak the local dialect, or, or are you just... <sighs> I speak a little bit of Sarani, enough to like get by, which is the Iraqi Kurdish dialect. My Kramaji, which is the, the, the Syrian Kurdish dialect, is garbage, and I barely right. know pleasantries. So you have, you have a handler that's taking, yeah. you, taking you around. Yeah, yeah, you, you usually do in a war zone. And it, like, it, it, as much as like you need someone to like drive for you, which was in our case, this dude, Alan, who this has nothing to do with anarchism or feminism, but the, the love this man had for cigarettes was pure and beautiful. Like I've never seen a man enjoy terrible terrible cigarettes as much as a lawn. He would just <laughs> smile at us with like this, this, he usually worked with women because our fixer usually would only work with female journalists. So he's like Capri 100. No, they just won't smoke because they're like from New York or whatever and like they don't like it. Oh, so and okay. he, he was working with like two men and neither of us are regular smokers but we were willing to humor him so we wound up smoking like three packs a day just to make a lawn happy because the joy on his face was so pure. <laughs> But, um, but, but, they were, but they were crap cigarettes? <laughs> oh, they're garbage. Right. Uh, the, the world sends its worst cigarettes to Syria. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, and, it, and we put it in English <laughs> on the pack. Yeah. There's no warnings on the packs. Yeah. Like that's how bad the cigarettes are. They don't it, even. It says it won't you. give you cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will make you pack. fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, 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 I, so uh, 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 sorry, Dan. Uh, you're on the ground, Rob, and you're gathering stories. You're going through a handler that's uh, interpreting for you, mm -hmm. and what is your relationship with like locals? Like when they see you, do they th do they see you as a friend, a threat, or just kind of a non-combatant? <clears throat> like it's easy going. Well, this is you know one of the things about the Middle East is that like, or at least the parts of it I've been to, because I don't have a, a comprehensive knowledge, but I've spent a lot of time in Iraq, and I've, I've now been to Syria, and I've spent a bit of time in, in Turkey and in uh, the UAE. People one to one, no matter what you're doing, are incredibly friendly on a, like a general basis. And like some of them will like happily tell you like, oh yeah, the the Marines killed my family, or like a U.S. bomb killed my dad, or whatever. But like, you want to go have tea, or like, or if you need a place to stay for the night, I'll put you up for the night. It's just like it's a so, cultural. So they thing take there. you as a one on one, like just regular guy. It's just sort of politeness and welcoming a guest is like a deeper thing than religion in that part of the world. And are, so I've are, almost never gotten a cold reception. Are, are there women that do what you do that would get the same reception, or is is it, is it easier to be a, a male journalist doing that? 
it depends in a little bit on the situation. There are certain times where it's easier to be a woman just because people will be friendlier to you. It's much harder in other ways and in some ways more dangerous. But like if you're working with the military, for example, you can get a lot of pictures of stuff you shouldn't be able to get pictures with if you're a woman and you'll just pose with the guys for a shot on their cell phones. And then like you can take pictures of the military base, you can take pictures of the tanks, like they'll let you do whatever. Um, it's just sort of this, like how much you're willing to kind of lean on that. Because you um, think you're taking selfies. You can just well, disguise. I went with like... my wife to Iraq three times. And when we got back from the second trip, she'd met all these Iraqi soldiers and like they'd all exchanged Facebook information. We'd gotten some like great access and like had a really good time. And then we like, we're in Istanbul in the hotel and she pulls open Facebook and she starts getting fa or uh, whatever Facebook like video message from like 30 to like half of the Iraqi <laughs> fifth federal police battalion. You're like being like, hey, you want to talk? You want to, they don't speak any English. Are, are you, are, are you like, do you ever get any watch list bullshit from like, like customs and stuff like that? I never have any issue. Okay. Well, how do yeah. you file that emotionally or slash sociopolitically as a as a nomadic journalist like who's probably doesn't have as many like prejudices? Um, but okay, that's your wife, and then the Facebook messages come in. Do you file that as predatory? Do you do you have a different way of looking at that? I mean, they're not it, uh, like it's um. It's it's a, it's complicated. Uh, like there's a lot of really gross misogynistic anti woman behavior that you encounter in that part of the world, even if it's hidden from you, even if they don't show it to you as a guest. Um, in that particular case, I got the feeling that these were just lonely soldiers up at the front line who That's like what I thought you might wanted, say, to, that wanted like, to meet a friend. It's they, like if you were a USO performer I, and you and they were on a submarine or something. I mean, as you should always do in those situations, I kind of went off of her feelings, and at every given step, was like, "How do you feel about this? Like, what do you want to do? And, and, like, well, you don't have to high road level me. at yeah." yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When you when you post your uh, like your pieces, are, like, if you're e emailing them back to your source or to your uh, you know wherever you're sending it to, do you get um, like any what do you call it uh, like 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 what's the word Davis censorship? Are they, are they going through your stuff and censorizing you? No, but you know, for I, there's a couple of things I should point out. One is that I don't do like the daily like I don't work for the New York Times. I don't work for um, you know the BBC. I'm not like filing stories right. every day and then having them like run up on the air. That's not the kind of work I do. As a general rule, I just come home with whatever I come home with, write whatever I want to write with, and. Some of it gets published. Some of it they're not interested in. Um, right. In but, this but, case, but no, I'm just no, going to throw no, up Nobody's whatever. going through and bodlerizing and censoring your stuff. No, I um, I spent like a weird morning in Mosul during the fighting there, just watching like U.S. airstrikes hit apartment blocks and stuff, and like um, nobody censored, stopped, tried to stop me from talking about that. And are like, these considered? Just, I mean, like, it, it, but we're talking about places where it's not even. It's not even explicitly declared whether or not there's a war going on or not. It's just, it's just a mixing bowl of conflict. So, are you wearing a vest that says "press"? And would that matter? I did the first when I went to Ukraine, which was my first trip out. I wore a vest um, just because I didn't know what to expect, and I was like, dumb. "Meaning, a, what do you mean Kevlar? Do you yeah, mean like?" A, like a, 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 a but I'm also vest. talking about just like this sort of like, "Hey, I'm I'm a journalist," kind of like insignia. In most of these areas, if you're like a clearly American person walking around, everyone kind of knows your press. Like, the, especially in like these parts of Syria, like the only Americans going through are either UN foreign aid, and there's not that many of those people who are like like Westerners, or you're you're just a journalist. What's and the they're, reaction they're pretty used uh, to it. when you meet locals and they know that you're from the U.S. or or that you're not from Syria? Like, what's their reaction to you? Are they are they, are they friendly uh, automatically or uh, wary of you? In, in nine times out of ten, people are friendly. The only places I got really negative reactions in Syria were um, when we were in Raqqa, which was the former capital of the Islamic State, there were a lot of older men who you could tell had kind of bought into the status quo under ISIS, and you got a lot of staring daggers at them, very mean looks at them. Like, we uh, we also went to Al Hall, which is the, the uh, refugee camp where they're hosting most of the arrested ISIS brides. So like the women who had like left parts of the Western world and joined the Islamic State. 
Um, and a lot of them, like we had this one weird moment where we're walking through the camp and we're just surrounded by these women and they're in, they're in full niqabs, which is like the full black headdress. And it's like, as soon as you try to lock eyes with them, they flip down this little visor thing so you can't even see their eyes. And like, we'd been out with, um, we'd been talking to like guards at the camp who'd been showing us like knife wounds and bite marks and stuff. Cause like the, a lot of these women, like some of them will make shivs or they'll get knives smuggled in and they'll stab a guard and then they'll run back into the crowd and you can't tell who did it. So like we were just surrounded by this crowd of women, you can't see their eyes or anything. And like that was like definitely some navigative vibes there. But I also had a long conversation in like a, a trailer with these two ISIS women who had willingly joined the Islamic State from uh, Jamaica and Barbados. And they spoke perfect English. And we're talking about like, like literally one of the sentences I heard was, when we first came to the Islamic State, it was Irie. And it was like, wow. what? <laughs> And like at one point, my my colleague and I, Jake Hanrahan, um, who's a, a British conflict journalist, it was Irie. Yeah, it was oh, Irie. Fucking hell! And we're like, we're having this pleasant conversation. You're very polite to us, but like, tell the truth. If the walls came down right now, Jake asks, you'd have our heads cut off. And they're like, yeah. And it's just like, okay, well, at least we're on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we in the we in the states here. I mean, we do. When I, I the way I met Wyatt Cynic was uh, doing that Courtney Cox pilot that was ripping off Daily Show so a million years ago, like when I was working for Dino as a writer, and we did this like remote piece where Wyatt went to talk to Terry Metzger, the head of the Aryan, former head of the Aryan Nation, and like oh, Metzger, it was like it was, yeah. like it was like all this gag, you know, and it was like of course he, yeah. you know, it's like like the white nationalists mm -hmm. back then, it was like it was always like a puzzler of like really they want us to send a black guy and a gay guy to talk to them about who they hate more and really it's like 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 oh yeah I, it, it, I, that's my segue into the fact that what amazes me about you is you go and do all this other stuff so I'm pretty sure blackout drunks aside that the last time you were on the show I spent a great deal of my energy going like how do you have the chutzpah the gumption the stuff to like to go to these corners of the earth, not to uh, maybe corners of the earth is a is, that's a, a, a Eurocentric kind of right in the slur. middle. Uh, yeah, they're 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 like in the yeah, yeah. like the fertile crescent of yeah, yeah everything. <laughs> the navel of the earth. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's actually really fair. Um, yeah. uh, we, it, it, it's undulating dance, mm -hmm. summoning all of it. Okay, there I go. We're like, we're like right in the middle of its four pack. If it's got like pretty good abs. Yeah. What, like, what, what, yeah. what was the, uh, the the tipping point for you to just uh, decide to go out and go into pretty like sketchy, dangerous parts of the world to be a journalist? I like, mean, you know, it, it was um, it was this really it kind of came from a really narcissistic place of just growing up raised on Hollywood action movies um, and not being willing to join the military, um, but like wanting to know what it was like to see conflict and to even like having this desire to like I want to know what it's like to get shot at, um, and then going there and realizing like oh that stuff is like one percent of what you do and mostly what you do is meet like the nicest people you've ever met. Because there's something about not that war is good for you, which is a bad would be a bad lesson to take from this, but that conflict and terrible circumstances tend to reveal the best in people more often than they reveal the worst. And, and that those so, stories don't get clicks. No, they, they, they sure that, don't. That no, that fear and evil kind of propagate by, you know, the fear that I feel when I think about the Middle East as a hornet's nest in a place I'd never go is part of the problem and yeah. that 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 you're inoculating things somehow you know you're 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 going deep in there but the but the I'm I mean the thing that blows my goddamn mind is that on the ride over here you know, I'm like reading your very thoughtful stuff cuz it's like Look, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't have dismissed you as an adrenaline junkie. However, I would have been able to at least find a place for you in my map of the cosmos as like a guy who's like wants to be where the action is and where the truth is and stuff. But you, you, you have this. You, you, you are really into you, you, you investigating this domestic situation oh, that yeah. we've got going yeah. on, and that and that involves absolutely no romantic, hurt, lockery, fun, like, pack your bags and duck your head because the rotors are buzzing and things. Like, it's all just mind-numbing, heart-aching investigation into the gears of the fucking 8chan and the 4chan thing. It did get a bounty on my head. 
I'm sure it yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From 4chan, 15 bitcoins. I would. So, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, <laughs> I, I probably faster than any work you've done. in, yeah. in the da- most dangerous places on earth, which is how much? Uh, are, are you a big history buff? Like, how much? Uh, yeah. How much? Like. Knowledge? Do you have to go into that like when you when you land and hit the hit, uh, hit the ground in Syria? Do you have to know about the the oh, whole Syria. history of it? Because I, I mean, he, in a, in, a, in a much shittier, like way less important version of that, what you're doing, I did comedy in Kosovo, and trying to learn about the Balkans and like what what's gone on yeah. there. It's crazy, and there's no getting around how complicated all that is. And I read, 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 and, I read and, and like I still don't know what the fuck is going on there. Yeah, you know, it's um, I'm a big believer. Like when I report on white nationalism, um, I've read almost everything, like pretty much everything. I can and, get and, my hands and, and you're on, for it, like, right? Yeah, big okay, fan. Okay, yeah, big fan. I mean, it's it's um, once you do just the cursory amount of research, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It sells itself. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Go ahead. Um, no, so like I do a lot of. I tr- I've tried to get deep into the history on that, but when it comes to like, I do as much reading as I can. But like, really, you can't understand the full depths of all of these conflicts. Yeah, if, if six hundred years of fucking conflict. Yeah. So like, what you do is you ask people there what they think you need to know, um, and like you have you do that to enough people that you feel like you've gotten a good base of like things of like what I actually need to understand in order to understand this place. And then you take what they've told you and you do more research and you try to present things with as much context as you can. But you also accept that like there's only certain stories you can effectively report on about that part of the world as someone from outside of it because like you don't speak the language, you don't have an in-depth knowledge of the history, um, which is why the kind of stuff that I have been trying to report on like what I focused on when I was in Syria is the stuff that's going against the grain of history, which is very much like what everyone in Rojava will tell you they're trying to escape from is like the grain of history that has caused so much problem or so many problems for like the people in that region over such a long span of time and has caused all these structural imbalances. Is there a generational thing that's happening where like there's a youthful kind of sur- like a upsurge of like let's escape the past? Yeah. That's a big part of it. And you you meet a lot of older people there who, you know, like the women I would talk to who would say, like, I don't think this guy really means it. I don't think that guy really means it. I think this guy's playing lip service. And you would kind of have to parse it with the older guys, which one belie- which ones believed in sort of the feminist revolution aspect of what was going on and which ones didn't. And so a lot of my conversations were trying to, like, figure out, like, how the old guys felt about it. And then at one point, we wind up in this office with a bunch of Asaish, which are, like, the local military police. And it's a mixed... Everyone in there is in their early 20s. And it's a mix of young women, some of whom are wearing uh, headdress, headscarves, and some of whom are wearing... are just, like, bareheaded. And, like, men. And a lot of them have tattoos, and they're all, like I said, in their early 20s. And I start asking them this, like, how do you feel about men and women working together? How do you feel about this new system? And they all start really awkwardly giggling to the point where it's obvious it was obvious that it was like if I'd walked into a mixed group of like men and women working together in like Orange County and been like how do you guys feel about women and men working next to each other and they would all be like what the fuck are you talking about dude really like that and and that was the thing like the people that I got to know well and talking about they were like the we just have to keep the old people who don't really believe shamed into falling in line long enough for them to die off and the young people to grow up living this really way. wow it, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 so, so how that, big that is can be how... a dangerous methodology <laughs> yeah I, yeah I, it can I, lead I, to a Logan's uh, run so it, tur- it turns out yeah. some of them can whip that fire whip right around Gandalf's ankle uh, mm-hmm. right at the last minute and get a whole so, new so this, this women based uh, militia and like kind of uh, are they, are they yeah a, if you, you can see him if you pull up picture number seven I think was that oh we got pictures oh yeah there's pictures I love this but podcast. yeah what were you asking oh yeah go back oh shit yeah but, yeah uh, so like, like how, how prominent are they and how many like what's like per capita like how, how many of them are involved in what's going on uh, there are a pretty substantial number of, of the forces like in the field. Uh, it's kind of hard to get numbers, but you can get a picture for it just by looking at military checkpoints because it's a mix of men and women working the checkpoints and doing like the job of garrison duty. And from that, I'd guess somewhere around a quarter to a third 
Um, you can also get an idea by one of the things, so about 11,000 uh, mostly Kurdish, but also Arabic fighters and also foreign fighters died fighting ISIS. Um, and they call them the, the Shahids, which means martyr. Um, and their pictures are all over the place. Pictures of different martyrs are all over the place. And quite a few of them are young women. Um, there's a lot of women who are 16, 17 years old. Did, 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 hmm. Are there women in like high military status? Like, yeah. like, like, like generals and... So if you work in the Middle East and cover conflict, you will run into a situation very often where in order to get into a certain area or to embed with a military unit, you have to sit in a room with a bunch of elderly generals and drink tea with them and maybe have lunch with them until they're like, all right, you guys can get in the Humvee and go on and do your thing. They just want to like sit with you and get sort of that FaceTime with you. And I had that meeting for the first time in Raqqa uh, where the person who was in charge was not a man. And it was a woman in her 60s um, who was a, an older Kurdish fighter, probably former PKK, who was one of the co-presidents of security for the city of Raqqa. And so she and this man were like running security for the whole city. And she was, from the instant we stepped into the room, clearly in control. And nothing started until she was ready to go, and nothing stopped until she was ready for it to stop. We've got her picture in here, too. But I want to go back to this at some point. Um, where the, is this that? is your rap, your, the rap you wanted to do. Yeah, number three. <laughs> yeah. So that's her. Um, she's the, she's the, the Queen yeah, Elizabeth, yeah. The, the, the titan. Yeah, and she... Um, uh, <laughs> and who's, who's smiling Jack over here? That's her, that's her partner, and when we asked him, what do you think about all of this like women's revolution and feminism stuff, he was the guy who was like, oh, I'm, I'm totally about it. And she just like laughed and waved her hand at him. And it was like <laughs> clearly this like dismissive gesture, like, yeah, fuck you. We've been in arguments together. Ah. Like, I know how you really fucking think, dude. Um, I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's really interesting. Like of all places, you, you would think that that would not be the place where women were uh, like controlled military and like governmental control. Yeah, I want to, there's a story I want to tell really quickly, just so I don't forget to do it. If you want to go back to picture seven, there's a woman in the middle of that, uh, of that picture. You see that young woman with the glasses? Mm -hmm. She was 16 years old when ISIS took over the city that she lived in. And one of the first rules they instituted for women was that all women had to wear the niqab, which is the full black, uh, uh, like full body covering. And she went out one day with a white belt around it. And a member of the Hizbah, which was ISIS's religious police, saw her. And she was sentenced to 1,500 lashes for wearing a white belt. And the way she described it to us is, that's enough lashes that three different men had to deliver it because their arms gave out. And it took her four months to recover from the whipping enough that she was able to move around and eventually escape through the lines and reach the Kurdish-controlled chunks of, uh, of northern her, her Syria. Her there under the tree with a gun in her hand. Yeah, yeah. With the glasses. I can't believe that wouldn't kill you. Yeah, it, it can. It, it does a lot of the time. But there like are a number of women out. died. Yeah. Um, so she reaches the Kurdish lines, and the first thing she sees is a soldier, a young female soldier of the YPJ holding an AK 47. And the way she explained it to us is as soon as I saw that woman holding a gun, I was like, that's what I want to do. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's this bitter sweetness to it because it's like we in the West have been having this for 200 years of like, and it's, it's really hard to unbraid it because it's like guns are penises and mm -hmm. men are violent and that's part of the problem. And then, but we also like these stories of like, you know, I I injustice becoming justice and like equality taking the form of women yeah. women holding these weapons of destruction and, and it's like it's it the mind just spirals and while the mind is spiraling one must then go why is your mind spiraling because there are too many poles going on here like like get rid of them and achieve stabilization and if you have to do that by i i it, it's like whatever means you have to do that i R mean Rob, if, a, if a person took 120 you know lashes uh, we we got different like so they give you sort of their war name so it always starts with haval which is a word in uh Kermaji kurdish that means friend or you might translate it to comrade it's sort of like calling everybody around you comrade would have been back in the early days of the soviet revolution um and her last name i have trouble pronouncing but it's the kurdish word for revenge 
No shit. Yeah. So like Comrade Revenge was the name that she. So, so th- this th- this is post her being whipped fifteen hundred times. Yeah. And yeah. she's sitting there and looking like she's, like. And like she, she was getting training at this. She was actually helping to train the younger women in the unit. So this was part of an all uh, Arab unit of the YPJ. Um, so these young women were all getting trained to fight, and it was like. I talked to a number of them. We spent like a sizable chunk of a day there and we actually got, <laughs> I have a bunch of papers that I have to translate that's like their coursework on feminism because it's a two month boot camp, and the first month is on historical training and like feminist theory and like understanding like the relation of men and women throughout the ages and like the birth of authoritarianism. Like that's part of the military training along with how to shoot an AK-47. So, okay, well, that's really interesting. I, mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to derail, but that no, sounds like a rabbit hole that's talk worthwhile. About. Like, how does their yeah. history of feminism... Hey, Rob, uh, sc- scoot down over here so that the people can see uh, all, sure. all the photos here. So, like, in case like it's blocking anybody. Um, I mean, when they, when you, when, so when, if you're... I mean, that just... Like what? What history of feminism are they, they're getting a completely different one? Obviously, there's there's not a, they don't do a slideshow. This is Susan yeah. B. Anthony. Like they, they <laughs> yeah, have a completely no. different history. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it, it a lot of it does focus on like significant women in both the history of the region and the world who they like see as sort of icons in this long struggle. A lot of it's the stuff that Ajalon wrote about his theories on when human beings tra- transitioned from hunter gatherers to agricultural societies and when like the enslavement of women on a systemic basis began. And okay. it's like tr- coming to understand all of that. God damn. Um, yeah, it's some surprising stuff to encounter are, are, are in the they, middle of the Syrian desert. Are, are they heralded and, and, and being like applauded in like like their local areas for being women in power or w- being a women militia? Some of their parents uh, they are disowned from and will not be going back home because their family didn't want them coming and joining and some of their parents... Some of them expressed that, like, my family was like, yeah, when I was a kid, this would have seemed impossible, but after ISIS, they were just like, fuck it, why not? Um, so it was a mix. But, like, w- w- will they ever be heralded, heralded as heroes, or are they just going to kind of be footnotes, like, in a weird, you know, crisis? You know, there's, um, there's a kind of realpolitik that you encounter, particularly working with Kurdish forces in any part of the world, and I've, I've been with them in Iraq and in, and in Syria, and they're both very different chunks and both very different ideologies, but they both understand how optics work, um, both like the Iraqi Kurdish movements and the Syrian Kurdish, Syrian Kurdish movements. And so they understood from the beginning that having female fighters up at the front line looked really good in terms of getting the U.S. to support you with airstrikes. Um, because like that just sells back home a hell of a lot better. The than, way like, to a man's heart is a woman with a gun. Well, yeah. You can't argue with the effectiveness. <laughs> One of the differences is that for the Iraqi Kurds, um, that having actual women on the front line stopped being a thing as soon as the immediate threat of ISIS overrunning their capital stopped being a thing. And in Syria, they're still all over the place. Um, they're still running, leading men into battle. Like you would, it, it, it was so comprehensive that it, like, because a part of you as a journalist, you're like, is this just a put on for me? Or are they like trying to like play up a show or whatever? Right. And um, a certain amount of time after like looking back behind you and just seeing like a young woman in a headscarf like going over maps with a guy like 40 feet behind you, like where you're not filming, where you're not looking at, and they're clearly trying to figure out where to position their guys and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you just accept that it's happening and that it like isn't weird for a lot of the people anymore. Now look. If you've got a bunch of photos, we can go through all of them, or I can segue to domestic, which is only going to make my stomach hurt. So I'm happy to go through photos of. <laughs> I mean, you know, like if you've got a bunch of photos, let's look at. I, them. I, I would, I would be happy to see more photos of these women. That are... We we do. Uh, the, it's the thing is, I just, I'll just let me say this one thing, and then mm-hmm. we don't have to talk about domestic again because we do. I'll have talk a, about we, domestic. We, we, all we, you want, I know yeah. you want to. That's the thing that impresses yeah. me about you is that you're clearly passionate about that shit and have such an eye for it um but google rob evans um and scroll past the kid stays in the picture um and the history of paramount doing porn and um and 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 see rob evans pieces about 8chan and 4chan and 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 the stuff and it's like don't like just, I, it's <sighs> I, look, it's not. I, 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 it, it takes ten minutes, and it fucking hurts like drinking yeah. Nyquil. But then, um, right? Why does drinking Nyquil hurt? That puts yeah, that's you to pretty sleep. Normal. Uh, uh, wheat grass. Wheat grass. 
it's disgusting, uh, but you feel a little better after you drink it. Like you're a little more armed for 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 something and stuff. You talk about shit posting, which I really didn't know the definition of, yeah. and all kinds of stuff. But um, we 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 have guests coming up who are delving into that area, and we, and we can have you back anytime. And if you've got a bunch of fucking photos from your trip to Syria, let's go through them and listen to you tell stories. Yeah, I, I get, like there's one spiel, little spiel I'd like to go on about the domestic side of things that like I talk Please. about this. I've been doing like I was on the BBC and NPR and like doing a bunch of shit after the last shooting because they call me up every time someone from 8chan murders people. Um, and there's something I never get to talk about what, or I talk sorry, about. Sorry, interrupt you. Uh, what is 8chan? I don't know what that is. Is, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that two times worse than 4chan? If the yeah. internet's asshole, if the, if the asshole of the internet had an asshole, that's 8chan. And it's actually called 8chan. Yeah, 8chan called developed 8chan. to because. Uh, yeah. Child porn was banned on 4chan. And, and they're Gamergate. like, well, we can't have this. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it was popularized because yeah. of Gamergate, but I think that's why it was invented. It's like, we need a 4chan to, to trade ch- uh, child mm-hmm. porn. Yeah, what? it was. Uh, yes, it, that's the starting point. It's, it's and it like, only got worse. <laughs> yeah. It, they, they took a real Nazi turn after 2014. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's stupid and it's sad, but it's why like eighty people have died this year. Um, and, but there's um, a really important provocative cover. I'm, I'm going to let you yeah, do yeah, your yeah, rant yeah, in yeah. one yeah, second yeah, because yeah, I yeah. can already hear like from my from my wonderful like 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 audience that that I, like I, I respect the hell out of them. And like if I only think about the stuff on the drive over here, I I, I like. I thought the same thought immediately when all this talk about like we got to pull the plug on eight channel all this stuff. And my first thought is like, well, wait a minute, that can't possibly be the solution. And I don't want anybody listening to this podcast to think that like um, I've. It, it's just that, like your. That's why I say go Google Rob Evans, read his shit. This guy, as much as he's been in Syria and Iraq, <laughs> has been on four chan and eight chan, and. Just read the stuff because it doesn't. It's not forcing you to do anything. Just read his stuff and 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 start to like understand uh, 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 the climate of and uh, the definitions of what is. When do you start to call something an actual like fucking cell? I and and I just. Like uh, the fact that I have to gingerly say that is like a sign of the crazy ass times. But now do your thing. Yeah, I mean, I um, so I started covering eight chan in 2014 because I was a comedian at that point in time, and I worked for a website called Crack dot com that did oh, yeah. a comedy video about uh, personifying different websites on the internet as like kids in a high school, and it personified eight chan as this creepy kid like hitting on uh, another young woman in like a really creepy and abusive way. And like that was the joke is that that's the kid 8chan would have been in high school. And they found the video and they got angry and they didn't go after the director of the video who was a man. They didn't go after any of the writers of the video who were men. They went after the actress and they started like sending dead animals to her house, letters written, blood to her house. Like also, this is like 2014. So I start like, I just start checking in on these guys couple of times a year, just because I'm like, what the fuck is happening here? Um, and uh, in 2016, the president retweets a meme that they create. You guys saw that picture of um, Hillary Clinton with like with the Star the of David Star behind of her David, that says yeah. most corrupt candidate ever? That was an 8chan meme. So I wrote a thing about them for the comedy website that I wrote for at that time, and then I just keep looking in. And then the Christchurch massacre happens. And because I'd been working on extremism and stuff during that time, I read the guy's manifesto and I see that it was posted on 8chan and I like write a thing about it like while the bodies are still warm and suddenly like all these journalists from legacy media are being like, can you explain the internet to us? Um, And like that's why I'm in this position. But what I think is important for people to understand that I tell to every journalist from a big station that talks to me that they never play. They never put it on the radio, they never put it on TV. This shit goes back further than the internet as we know it. In the early 1980s, there was a terrorist group called The Order, which was inspired by a book called The Turner Diaries, which is a fictional book about a white race war that is sparked by like terrorist cells carrying out like random acts of violence. It's a and fantasy. It's a fantasy about for white supremacists. Fascists, yeah, who maybe don't call themselves fascists, blowing up enough yeah. shit. And the terrorist group in the book is called the Order, and the real terrorist group was called and, and the Order. And they're protagonists or antagonists? Oh, they're, they're the heroes. They're protagonists, like most 
yeah. terrorist written fiction. It's, doesn't yeah. really have good structure because so it's it's just like once upon a time we blew up enough shit that we got to <laughs> we pick, got to be America which women we got yeah. to fuck and it was great Timothy and then McVay we nuked the it. Urals yeah um, so this real terrorist group called the or- called the Order starts up and they mostly rob banks and armored cars they only kill a couple of people but they make off with about four million dollars in cash some of it goes to buy rocket launchers and oh, machine yeah, th- guns this and I shit. Know about. Okay. This part people know. What people don't know is that most of the weapons that the money bought got confiscated eventually. The army and shit tracked them down. The FBI figured that shit out. But a lot of the money went to buy Apple II computers and early networking equipment, which connected KKK cells and new neo-Nazi cells and like white supremacist readouts in places like the Aryan Nations up in Idaho on an early internet network called LibertyNet. Now, this is in the mid-1980s. By the mid-1990s, there were researchers realizing there's an organized neo-Nazi presence on, like, Usenet and shit, like, the early internet, like, on these fucking, like, uh, what were they even called? Not, not message boards, like, even fucking before news that groups? shit. News groups? News um, groups. Like, alt.politics and shit. Like, there's Nazis all over these places. And they start finding Nazi manifestos written about how to radicalize people on the internet and how if somebody confronts you, the first thing to say is, I'm not a Nazi. Use humor and jokes and try to claim that you're just joking if people call you on, like, your ironic fascism and stuff. And, like, if we just put this stuff out into the atmosphere often enough, Enough. This is how we can recruit people, and so what we've seen, what we're seeing with 8chan, and not just with 8chan, but with like this broader constellation of like neo Nazis and fascists on the internet who were radicalizing larger and larger groups of people, and who sort of metastasized in the 2017 Charlottesville march, where you got hundreds of these people in real life, is the culmination of 30 years of really diligent work, um, and that's why I try to treat these people and have tried to push the mainstream media and when I speak to law enforcement, when I lecture at colleges, try to talk to them about, you have to treat them as if they're like ISIS or Al Qaeda and maybe they're not that organized and they're certainly not a central figurehead of the group, but they function that way and they've been doing so for decades and it's time we acted like it. Yeah, you have to at least ask yourself in terms of group psychology, what if these people weren't white? Now, uh, the, the, the brick wall that I run into is like, well, how can you possibly punish a medium? Like, how can... And that's what all of my friends also say, too, the minute we hear this stuff. Like, we just go, like, well, how could pulling the plug on a fucking place where people get together and say, who wants to mass shoot? How can pulling the plug be the solution? Um, and just reading a couple of your your pieces, like, st- started to nudge me over, where I, because unlike me, yeah. who's just simply... A forty-six-year-old dude waking up and going, "Yeah, but at the end of the day, but the I, I, I it, yeah, and 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 that's why I say to you guys, like, because I, I, it, I, I don't, I don't presume anything about you guys in these turbulent, turbulent times, like, it, 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 and I think that's that it, from reading two of your pieces, that was one of the things I really respected is your acknowledgement of the psychological effect of just mm-hmm. shit. Yeah. Just just too much information and how there is like like that is like if if we had if you hadn't been to Syria, that would be an hour long conversation I'd want to have is like how in the hell, what is the responsibility of the discerning humanitarian individual when they're trying to figure out what is the difference between shit posting, trolling, par- propaganda, and an outright like thing to bother attacking? What is anyone supposed to do? Because it's obvious what the quote-unquote enemy wants to happen, which is fatigue, mm-hmm. shock, and awe. Yeah, they want you offline. They want you to do what I have done. Right. Delete Buy Twitter. a gun and get in your swimming pool. And I am proud, well, I'm not proud, but I am not afraid to shamefully admit. I've never seen they you. They won. I, I'm, I've I, never I, seen I, you in the pool, though, with your gun. That's the next Well, oh, that's man. A look, that's challenge their, accepted. That's now, phase three. Now, first off, this is off topic, but if you haven't gone pool shooting. <laughs> now, Dan, I come from Texas, yeah. and rolling down a moving body of water with a rifle. That's some good times. <laughs> Look, good times. I'm, I'm not going to pretend I, it's I, not. I, I, I can't I, tell I if think, you're kidding. I, I think <laughs> myth- I'm not kidding. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure myth- Mythbusters proved that bullets don't work underwater. Well, so no, but he's talking about tubing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is tubing, something I've always done, like shooting. lazy river yeah, tubing, yeah. tubing plus seat shooting. shooting, right? Tube shooting. Tube shooting. See, that, that, like, I'm not a big gun enthusiast, but I would go tube shooting. 
Yeah, <laughs> I, who wouldn't? Who him. wouldn't? Pass, I, I would not go tube shooting with you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I want to be completely alone. Yeah, I, I would, well, I, they I, say we, about, you know, they, the old saying of never be the smartest person in the room. Never be the guy on the tube shooting trip that has the least experience with guns. And tubing. And tu- or tubes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah to only go tube shooting with Navy SEALs. <laughs> now, 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 Rob, like, I, I took uh, journalism school at USC like in the early 90s, and I, was, I, I think about like, what, what it must be like now to go into a journalism school today. Like, because th- th- this is... When I went there, it was, it was pretty pre-internet and certainly pre... Napster. You know, like, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was pre Napster for there's, sure. There's less focus on Napster. That's heartbreaking. But but like, <laughs> how do you approach journalism now? And like like when you're writing a piece and like you think of the market that's going to be delivered in, like, in, in a world of just just fake bullshit and like like, like how do you approach print journalism today? That's a reason I'm a big fan of the site that I write for. It's called Bellingcat. And these are the people, they were founded by a guy who was a something awful forums goon named Elliot Higgins. And something awful is also the forum that birthed 8chan, which is the forum that, or, right. the forum that birthed 4chan, Glad to which hear birthed you 8chan. Yes. Now, um, so Elliot's just like this nerd on the internet, and like when the Syrian civil war starts up, he starts getting interested just like looking at pictures of conflict through like Google images and trying to piece stuff together. And then he gets interested in like the fighting in Ukraine. And uh, there's been a number of stories that they've broken, but one of them is that after, um, I think it was MH17, um, the Malaysian air flight that was shot down over Ukraine, they just spent God knows how many hours combing over pictures of the wreckage and pictures of Russian troop movements at the time to identify which missile, based on the serial numbers on the missile, shot down the plane from like a Russian buck launcher and then tra- traced down like what launcher that missile was put onto and then traced its path from Russia into the Ukraine to prove that it was the Russian backed separatists in Ukraine who shot down the plane. And like that's the kind of journalism they do. Um, and I don't do that because I'm not nearly that smart. But like <laughs> that's, I think, a part of how you deal with the problem of like, well, nobody believes in truth. It's like, okay, right. well, you can put out this article where I'm not relying on trusting that you went here and talked to these people. I can pull up all of these images. I can trace the serial numbers on this missile. I can like do all this myself because you've spelled out how you're going to do it. And that's hard to argue with. Like um, when, we, when we look at the internet, and I'm, I'm, I'm using my I statements here. When I look at the internet and I go, this is at least 80% nonsense. Worse, poison. Yeah. Um, it might do me right to recognize that that's probably because I'm 80% poison. And that if, and that if I'm 20% decency mm-hmm. or health, that, that what that means is that there might be 20% of the internet that is decent. That, that you shouldn't expect those averages to be higher. You and, know, that what you, and you should expect yourself to have to dig a little, a little harder. How, how would you teach, like if you, like you said you give talks and you, you, yeah. you uh, like how would you, like you're talking to a bunch of, 18-year-old freshmen in college that want to go into proper print journalism. No, oh, I don't talk to those kids. Um, the, the, when I lecture, I usually lecture to counterterrorism students and to like new law enforcement, federal law enforcement oh, officers hell. about dealing with uh, particularly far, far-right terrorism, but in general with dealing with terrorist groups that use the internet to recruit. Um, I don't like... <sighs> I think journalism's kind of broken in the mainstream right. sense. The, yeah, the, the people that you're talking to might be our actual journalists. The people that actually go in there and make like like on the ground reports and say this is what happened and this is why. Well, but also, and here's one of the th- here's one of the reasons why I think mainstream and like most of the field is kind of kind of screwed right now, is that it has abandoned for sort of perceptions of the way things ought to be. It has abandoned actually mattering. Um, and that's important. In a world where somebody can just lie a thousand times to overwhelm your one truth, it doesn't matter that you're telling the truth. What matters is finding a way to get the truth to reach people. Right. And sometimes that involves thinking not like a journalist, but like a guy who writes for television or whatever. How, um, how do you know when you write something and, and, and you've gone and reported on something and you d- disseminate that, how do you have any faith that that is, will even land as truth? Well, you have to be willing to write a bunch of shit that nobody reads, which I have uh, and will continue to do until the day I die. <laughs> um, you also have to have an amount of faith in the fact that when people get scared, they'll pay attention to what makes sense. 
and the lies always make a kind of sense, but they're never a satisfying sense when you really turn them around in your head. And that's what you have to hope on. And that's something I believe on faith. That's not something I believe entirely because of the evidence of my own eyes, because it's not always true. Do you have editors and publishers that you trust that, that, that they'll appreciate what you're doing and that they'll make sure that what you've written gets out? Yeah, I've, I've been really lucky to work with good editors all my life, um, and I don't know how journalists work with ones who aren't. Um, you know, my, my editor at Bellingcat, when I started getting death threats and got that bounty put on me, was like... Wait, go wait, wait say what? Go back. He mentioned this. Bo- yeah. Bounty? I mean, please yeah. go over it, but Yeah, I was on... attention. A, after the Christchurch shooting, I was on a documentary for ABC Australia talking about 8chan and stuff, and like they found it, and they got angry at it, and they put a 15 Bitcoin bounty on my head. Oh, and shit, it's right. probably a joke, because it's 8chan. But, w- but it's probably that's the point. Not, yeah. Yeah. They could yeah. always say it's a joke. Yeah, exactly. Until you get shot, they're like, that yeah. was my idea. Right. So I reported it to the police, and like my editor went to her contacts in the FBI and like tried to get something. No, nothing got done. Nothing ever gets done. Um, but like that's the way... Like you know, there's not, there's also not much that you could do. Like one of the things I do. But you were I'm, saying your editor at Belling. Yeah, she yeah. like she like did everything she could to get people to take it serious, even though there's nothing that will be done about it. Because like, she considers her in. job to protect her creatives. Yeah, I shouldn't call you creatives. I should call you something else. The, the thing that made me like almost break down a little bit after the um, the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi um, was uh, his editor, uh, Karen Atia, uh, at the Washington Post and her reaction to it. And you could tell, like, she's one of those editors who would, like, take a fucking bullet for anybody, like, writing for her. And, like, yeah, you hope you work for somebody like that. Yeah. Um, it's crazy that, like, that now journalists almost seem like they're a part of, um, like, the intelligence service. Like, 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 like you're you're basically... Not spies, but you're you're certainly putting yourself out in real harm's way by simply caring about reporting truth. That that you, now you that you that you can get poisoned, murdered, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, decapitated, and all sorts of horrible shit. You know, I think that's actually kind of always been the case in journalism. I think what makes this more on sort of this edge where we're actually dealing with live intelligence rather than reporting cold intelligence is the fact that nobody, including the intelligence agencies, understands the world right now. Um, which is like a good situation to work in if you're somebody who gets <laughs> the internet 3% more than the right. guys working at the FBI. Because you're but like, bad look, for this the guy's world. obviously referencing the... Yeah. Yeah, you know, you need to understand what The meme what of this, and, and like, like a forty-year-old yeah. guy is like, "Wait, why? There's a meme." Yeah, I had like I had a time where I was trying to explain like the um, remove kebab meme and stuff, which I'm not going to explain here if you don't need it. It's just a racist meme that was referenced by the Christchurch shooter. But like having to go through this like manifesto line by line and explain like this is this in joke that these nerds told on the internet to each other. Um, it's like it's weird. And the amount, yeah, when you're going against entropy, when you side, here's, the, I mean, the thing that drives fascism, which is a modern invention, uh, you can't have an ancient fascist country unless you change your definitions, because you have, like, the tenets of fascism include, like, absolute nihilism and manipulation of the media takeover of it uh it, it, that includes this idea of like you have to subvert the very idea of truth which i see a thousand articles a day as much as i try to avoid the news i just see newsweek the uh, uh, time the cnn washington post i just see i see a different permutation of people coping with something that seems as a ninth grade history student to me to be the same headline over and over again which is Boy, these guys really will stop at nothing to make everyone not understand that there's an objective truth. See, I I think part of the problem is that um, fascists never tell the truth, but they are often the most authentic players in the media atmosphere and in the political space. Right. This is something, uh, to bring it back to ISIS, who I do think are, I think it's an Islamo-fascist movement, just like we have Christo-fascists here in the United States. You look at ISIS's recruitment propaganda, and you compare it to the recruitment propaganda of the United States military. You watch a US Marine Corps recruitment video, you're gonna see cool guys with guns, cool uniforms, you're gonna see cool tanks rolling everywhere. Nobody gets shot, nobody gets hurt, nobody's bleeding. You watch ISIS propaganda, and they'll follow a single guy from his journey leaving Canada and like going to the Islamic State and picking up a rocket launcher and fighting to him getting blown up and it zooming in lovingly on his like torn apart corpse on the ground. And that's the guy you're meant to be. And people embrace it 
because it's authentic, because we live in this culture where everything is like so plastic and formulated, and it was the same thing that was explained to me. I talked to this guy, he's a pretty sleazy dude, Rick Wilson, he's a former Republican political strategist, and during the 2016 election, I was talking to him about political ads, and we were evaluating Trump's first campaign ad with one of Hillary Clinton's most recent ads. And he said, everybody's making fun of Trump's campaign ad because it's so like juvenile and looks like some kid cooked it up on the internet. That's gonna do a thousand times more for his campaign than anything she could spend $20 million on because that feels like something a kid cooked up on his laptop because he cared. And it's the same thing with ISIS's stuff. It's the same thing fascists always have going for them, is that they're lying about everything. But the emotional truth at the core of the movement speaks to something in right. people. And a politician who's just trying to get elected never can. And you don't want to be distant from that. There, I, 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 there's a, there's a, I want to inculcate myself, it, 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 uh, but also present the lighter side of that, which is like, there was somebody that reached out to me through private messaging or whatever, said that they were a mental health professional and that they work with at-risk kids. And by at-risk, I mean particularly kids that are at-risk of self-harm. And um, that this person was writing to me to let me know that they put a quote from my show on the door of their office at this center where these kids that are not privileged, they're they're they've sunk down by virtue of wanting to die to the to the lowest like drain gutter and they're coming through him and he he liked the show rick and morty not community rick and morty which is very nihilistic mm -hmm. very like fuck it i i believe the quote was the thing that morty says to his sister which is like nothing matters mm -hmm. like nobody exists on purpose come watch tv which I did personally write because I and I did design it to appeal to the potential runaway in all of us. It is something that I wanted to hear when I was seventeen from especially uh, an imagined kid brother, and and um and he he said he put it on his door and that he was just reporting to me that it was like making kids trust him. Mm -hmm. And it brought me to tears because yeah. I got to tell my therapist, I'm like, I make this shit that's like, I just follow my heart. And sometimes my heart is dark and tortured and poisonous. And sometimes my heart is Pollyanna and all this stuff. But what you're talking about is like authenticity, the perceived authenticity of the message versus like when kids are attuned to the horse shit. So when I was young, Fight Club was this biggie. It was like, it just spoke to me. It mm -hmm. was like, oh my God, this movie gets it. Oh my God, the corporate America and all this stuff. Like anything that's horse shit, anything that goes through channels on its way to touch you, no matter how it's touching you, it would be simpler to just reach out and go, yeah, like I, maybe there is no God. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe life means nothing. Like It's like, I'm listening to this person first God forbid they tell me to do something terrible mm -hmm. because I'm I just can't I just don't have time for this fucking Pringles can over here. Like that's like yeah. oh sorry Jeff, I didn't mean to personalize that. <laughs> that's an inside joke kind of thing. But like that idea of like, yeah, no, this this contains no sucrose and this will eventually lead to your it, it sort of reminds me in high school of like the kind of battle that my teachers would tell me of like like at least the way they characterized it like during the Cold War when you're going to third world countries and you're pitching them democracy versus communism and you're basically saying if you if you go with us your grandkids are gonna maybe have a lot of bread mm -hmm. like they can buy it at a supermarket. If you go with them, everyone's going to eat a lot more tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and that was a mischaracterization, probably, of that conflict. But it was like it, it, the paradigm, like it, 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 it cuts to that, which is like authenticity, fidelity of messaging. Hey, talking to you, and I'm talking mm -hmm. to you fucking straight. Have you ever felt like killing yourself? Yes. And, and then the other person is going like, hey, Talking to you. Oh, didn't mean to scare you. Mm -hmm. Everything's uh, fine. Obviously, you've Why never thought you of sad? killing yourself, right? <laughs> no, of course, Uncle Henry. And okay, good night. I'm gonna go fuck your aunt Irene. <laughs> <laughs> and then drop dead Fred's over here. I was like, I'm gonna sneak out my window, and they're authentic. Mm -hmm. 
It is, I'm so glad you brought that up yeah. because it also is like, it's this shit posting thing where it's like people flooding a like squirting ink. Mm-hmm. There they go, like, D- define, here's my manifesto. D- define shit posting from me. Uh, uh, some, you, you, you take Shit that. posting is like sort of the tactic, and it's not like fascist or inherently right wing or left wing or negative or anything. It's just a thing that you can do to sort of flood a discussion or a conversation online with nonsense, usually a bunch of like meaningless memes or like stuff like that, in order to kind of distract any sort of conversation. Usually not just nonsense, but stuff that's like deliberately kind of emotionally provocative right. in order to kind of derail productive it's conversation. It's kind of an inverted dog whistle. And and it's, you know, the, the example that I brought up in the case of terrorism was how, like, the 8chan shooter had a bunch of, met, like, references to internet memes and stuff in his manifesto that, like, had nothing to do with anything and also would bring up people like Candace Owens, who he wasn't a fan of. But he knew that if he dropped her name in the manifesto, it would start, like, a right-wing, left-wing fight, and he could, like, sort of get people talking about that as, like, while they were also grieving Like Charles the Manson told his people go yeah. right right you know white people hate black people on the walls after you stab someone with a fork like, yeah it's like, not a totally new tactic it's right. just this is the term the internet yeah, yeah you just like for. sort of you're the grinch you're yeah. oscar you're a fan of entropy entropy is going to get you to where you want to be faster because order is not getting you anywhere uh all right anyways uh <laughs> also you have a new uh, children's book coming out <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's it's, uh, it's called good night moon it's, it's sorry called, you're broken yeah. into nine factional pieces <laughs> I was going to go, oh, the places you won't go because the Nazis have bombed the trains. <laughs> oh, the, oh yeah. the places you refuse to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you have kids, by the way? Good God, no. Oh, yeah. no, no, So no, this no, is no. a job that, yeah, that would make sense. Oh, no, I don't have kids because of all the Can drugs. Can I ask you a weird question? If you did have kids, how would you deal with that question? Because people would, like, load... I, 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 is yeah. there, like, if you, if you had kids, would you stop... No, I uh, I like I don't know. I'm not a parent, so like my advice on this is is almost meaningless. My my opinion as a former child is that uh, <laughs> you a should, retired child yeah, as a retired child, child retired yeah I yeah is, <laughs> retired child <laughs> aren't we all I love that I, I think you should let kids be interested in and read about and study about anything they want. I don't think you should necessarily let them watch anything they want. Like, and that was the rule my parents had for me that like, I'd have a lot of disagreements with my parents, but they were like, we're going to watch what you watch on TV, but any book is fine because at least he's fucking reading. Um, and like, I don't know if that works in the modern era because that can mean like the kid winds up on fucking eight chan. So like, well, that's what I, I was going to ask. Like, is there, um, are we supposed to censor? No, you know, I, I, I think censorship of that kind never works, which is not to say that like taking a site like 8chan off the internet the way that it has currently been taken off is bad, because I don't think that's censorship. I think that's being like, hey, company, do you want your name associated with the site that's killed 80 people? And they go like, yeah, right. no, we really don't. Um, but all that shit still, you can post that like elsewhere. Like in a, in a post-net neutrality world, let them have lower bandwidth. Um, yeah, I, I think what the only thing that really works in the long run when it comes to like fighting authoritarianism and fascism through raising better people um, is giving them a solid grounding both on like a one-to-one level and sort of the example you set as a human being of how they should treat people by how you treat people. And number two, give them a thorough grounding in history, um, which they won't get from school because like school history educations are garbage. So don't just tell them about World War II and the Revolutionary War. Talk to them about Bhopal, India and the East India Trading oh, Company. Come on. And like, yeah. Um, talk like, to them about... Sounds yeah. like vegetables. Yeah. History vegetables. You, uh, no you, wonder I were dying. I, yeah. I'm not even willing to do this, and I'm the coolest dad that could ever live. Are you a dad now, Dan? No. I'm like oh. you, man. I still got a fight to fight. No, oh, I'm no. just lazy, and I don't want to talk about Bhopal. I, that's kind of the problem. because the, the So no- I'm a hero for opting out of reproduction. Yeah, yeah that's, that's an option. That's my Syria. Yeah. Uh, singleness. I mean, I, yeah, opting out's a fine, a fine way to go. I don't know. I, I'm throwing I'm a lot at you. Go back kids. to what you were talking about. I don't know. Like, oh, fucking, what, what I will say, you were saying earlier, um, like, what can, what, what can be done to, like, fight this, and how do we actually fight it? And, like, the answer is that um, nobody, if, if you want to have a world where Nazis don't regularly come back into power and kill a shitload of people, and then they have to be fought, and then they get, like, 
beaten down for a little while and then 80 years later they come back again. If we don't want to have that world and we also want to live in a relatively free and open society, nobody gets to be just a comedy writer, which I was for a while. Nobody gets to be just a whatever you do. Uh, nobody gets to be just a teacher or a hairdresser or uh, a construction worker. Oh. Everybody also has to be involved in local politics. We're everybody has to be an anti-fascist. Everybody has to put some responsibility on themselves to keep shit from getting fucked up. We gotta, Otherwise, we it'll get fucked those, up again. Uh, we gotta eat those history vegetables. Well, like, <laughs> well we, gotta, we gotta eat those ideological vegetables. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the problems we have right now in our society, you look at some of the worst people who are currently on sort of the side of the right that's pushing a lot of violence right now, um, and the people often who aren't advocating it directly themselves, but who are saying things like that 600 million Muslims are radicalized terrorists, and then a guy who reads them a bunch goes and shoots up a mosque in Quebec City. Um, that particular guy, whose name I, I won't mention here, uh, has an un, has a screenplay that he just couldn't get sold in Hollywood, and Why Steve not? Bannon had right. some screenplays that he just couldn't get sold. And yeah. a lot of these guys who are currently right-wing grifters stoking outrage against immigrants and Muslims have screenplays that they just couldn't sell, what? have TV no. pitches they couldn't they, they, sell. They're just they failed screenwriters? And failed stand-up comedians. A lot of them are failed stand-up hey, comedians. Hey, I'm sitting right here. Gavin, Mc... <laughs> You're a success. You're on a stage right now. Thank you. <laughs> Proud Boys founder Gavin McGinnis couldn't uh, quite hack it as a stand-up comedian. I think of Dave Rubin's the same case. <laughs> So they get into politics because it's easier. And the people who are really good at this stuff, like a lot of them, enough, some of them succeed. And the ones who are decent people and don't succeed, they go find something else to do with their time. But the ones who don't succeed and are shitty, well, just, I can just be racist. And then I can make a shitload of money being racist and using the same tactics I learned to rile up a crowd and get them to hate immigrants. Um, and they're focusing on politics because it's the only place that they can make a living because they're not quite good enough to make us laugh. It's like Christian rock. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the evil version of Christian rock. It's like, I know four chords. Yeah. And I love Christ. Yeah. A little. Yeah. I can warm I can either love up. learning yeah. chords so much that I learn well, six chords, or I could double down thing. on my love of Christ. If I hear... If I hear if I hear any negative talk about Striper, I'm leaving the stage right now. <laughs> Nobody's talking bad about Striper. <laughs> Striper. Uh, but, like, it's the same thing. I love Christ. I love the Christ. <laughs> I love Christ. Two chords. Mm -hmm. Smoke on the water. You know, if, if this Rick and uh, Morty thing doesn't it, pan it, out... <laughs> it, it, it should have been walking on water. <laughs> Wait, no, no notes. <laughs> That's not... See, wait, that what would, do you mean? It should be Walk on the Water. I'm saying that song was Smoke on the Water's right, chords. Right, Yeah, but... That's so right. I was supposed to say Walk on the Water after I did that? got to the I chorus, yeah. Walk on the Water. Oh, well, I could have... Yes, I could have extended the bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And see, Dan, if you become a grifter, you never have to take notes again. I could busk. Well, you're not going to keep your lifestyle with that. Also, I can't play those three chords on any <laughs> instrument. I, I, don't, I don't even know what chord means. What, what, I. What, I, I, out, of, out of curiosity, what do you think a chord is? <laughs> and, and I'm asking that not ironically. Like, like, like it's what, a group what, of notes that... That. Harmonize together. I don't know. They work. They work together. Yeah. <laughs> and there's several different kinds of chords. What do you think the, the, the difference between a major and a minor chord is? Well, that it, 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 through, through the lens of a Logic Pro user, the difference is that the middle uh, line is either closer to the bottom line yeah. or closer to the top it, line. It, it's, you're flattening the third. Yeah. You're flattening one note yeah. by by half step. Yeah. What do you think? Come uh, at me, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think a sus chord is? I think it's a sustained chord, generally. Sustaining what? Well, sustaining the chromatology. <laughs> I don't know, man. We're like, fi I don't fuck what, you. What do you, what do you think? The, what, what, what do you think the overtone series is? Oh, I, it was the the, the follow-up to Downton Abbey. <laughs> it was a a, 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 a short-lived spinoff. Okay. 
the overtones, they, they were always that family that was like, well, I think the servants took the wine. Like, Get out of here, Maud. When do you, and then they became the overtones. Are you more about the diatonic or the chromatic? Uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll quote Donald Trump being quizzed about the Bible and go, I think both equally. <laughs> Remember that clip from him in the Camp J trial where they're like, what, New Testament, Old Testament? He's like, nah, both. <laughs> <laughs> so, so close to a hero. Yes. I, I honestly, He's like, that, how that's like Bob yeah. Roberts shit. Like, like, it's like Tanner 88, like fucking meta humor. Uh, you know, uh, both. Do, can I be president now? Because if I can, you're the idiot. He yes, proved that right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anyways, uh, you, you, you play any music, Rob? Good God, no. No? No, no never. I'm terrible at it. I, I, Have you no, ever tried no for it? Yeah, I played the tuba in high school. The tuba. That was the instrument. Now, are you they talking tuba or sousaphone? No, tuba. Tuba. That was sousaphones were for people who played the tuba and wanted to. Tubas were for people who couldn't play anything but had to get a music credit. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Dear heavens, were you like in a marching band or a like... uh, sitting band? Sitting band. Yeah. The fucking... Jeff, do you uh, t you got an email about because he has a fifteen bitcoin <laughs> price on his head? Like you sent me, uh, you stopped me. Do you want to talk about that at all? You got an email. <laughs> Wait, yeah. What was blackmailing you for five bitcoin? Oh, you did. Wait, what, what did that? you pay it? No, hang on. I, what I did mean, you I think five Jeff? bitcoins a lot. J Jeff okay. texted me, "Hey, can you loan me five bitcoin?" Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I got an email today. Um, I happen to know Ghislaine Maxwell, who is really in deep shit right now. She's in now. the headlines now. And she, I mean, I haven't seen her in many years, but she, like, she is a pal. And she is one of, she, probably the procurus for Jeffrey Epstein's sexual trafficking and, uh, empire. And... I met her at a charity event, and I, and I believe Jeffrey Epstein was there too. It was for Michael J. Fox's uh, Parkinson's disease thing. And we brought her on stage, and I sang a song to her. And everything she said was a lie, because she couldn't talk about what she did. Then we went out and hung out, and we remained friends. She and as such, you're probably in her phone book. Yes, and and like like I, I Greg Proops told me get her number off of your phone. I'm like, and you didn't. I, I said like every phone like text that we have is just her saying happy birthday. Like it's not right. like we're, we're, and she goes, Jeff, I'm 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 at the Soho house. Do you want to come join me for lunch? And we'll get there, and there's fucking Hugh Laurie sitting over there, and we talk about she's gonna buy the world's oceans uh, because she's. <laughs> She's a very fascinating lady. I didn't realize that she was possibly... But in. you... But you... Because uh, uh, applaud if you've received a spam <laughs> saying... Uh, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read this yeah, to you. Like, 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 I don't it, think it, this it, is like it, a it, Nigerian it, like thing. We, I all, think, I we, think we, we all get lots of spam and lots of emails saying that your social security number has been compromised and whatever. From confidential, confidentiality management. Hello. Comma. Uh, th th and also, it's signed by nobody. Th this whole thing sounds pretty fugazi. It has come to my attention, my, uh, the, 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 the person... <laughs> Mine, <yeah>. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it has come to this author's attention <laughs> that you may be at risk after a potential leak regarding Jeffrey Epstein. The potential leak being her phone I believe book. privacy and... I believe... I love this writing. It's so bad. I believe privacy and confidentiality are very important in the world we live in, and I am willing to offer my services to help my services in helping keep your confidentiality and privacy out of the public eye. I have resources and friends at all the top social media sites, news outlets, and government <laughs> and governments. All the tops. <laughs> This All is the top uh, governments. Top Man, governments. You are deep in the dark web top, now. We're talking top five governments here. <laughs> I mean, by the way, like, this is I've, Kevin. I've, this is Kevin Day. This is Kevin Day. I just wrote sure. this. Now it's just kidding, like Rob Kevin. Just kidding. <laughs> I've work with. I've apostrophe v, v, work with them in the past, helping others keep their privacy. In return, I I require a one-time payment of five Bitcoin. <laughs> Send to a link. Right. Uh, once payment has been received by my team, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get started scrubbing the internet to keep the privacy. Right. We'll make sure. So, 
Now, it, no one else got but, but, that but, email, but, but, right? But, but, but but is that because you because they know that Glenn Maxwell's phone number is I in my phone? I truly believe because I am like I I, you should I call I, her right now. No one's no one Let's else is getting Glenn. that email, and uh, but. I, you know, I was, I was a, I, I've humble bragged that I was collateral damage of Fap Gate or whatever the fuck it was, like Fap because, Celeb because Gate. of various like people, like, <laughs> and, and, like I, it's, it's not, it's truly, I think what that indicates, you have like actual knowledge. We could be like the Young Turks or like like some kind of like web based news agency. Like we have a scoop. Yeah, here. get Bellingcat. This to basically track down means that, link. that her phone's been hacked. I, I to me, that's I, what I, it suggests. W- w- what really freaks me out about th- that email coming in today is that I almost posted. A, she sent me. You a almost fr- sent him five Bitcoin because <laughs> you don't really understand what it's worth. But you were an early adopter, and I keep telling you, I, you're a trillionaire. Well, I, I, I think it was my 30th birthday at Chris Pone's house, and she was my date. And, and we, we threw a prom-themed based uh, birthday party. And she came as my date. I picked her up at the Peninsula Hotel. And she said, I've never been to a prom. And so I went there, and I got her corsage. And she's like, I've never done this. I've only seen this in movies. And so I pick her up, and we go to the thing. And we took a photo together. And then she sent me a photo framed in a sterling silver like like you know kind of eight by ten size frame and I have that and right before I saw that email from this clearly spammy bullshit I almost posted that photo and said like Mm-mm. this isn't gonna age well <laughs> yeah, you you, like, you, you should because, get rid of that photo. Every time I, t- I, 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 I on my uh, computer I'm, I have the Guardian and I have uh, Reuters that comes up right off the bat and it's all day pictures of Galen uh, w- standing next to Jeffrey Epstein exactly the years that like, like I knew her and I have a photo of where I look like I am the I'm the young Jeffrey Epstein in that photo. <laughs> Rob Evans, I see your knees twitching. Do you have? You're a conflict journalist. Do you have a take on this, the Epstein? Yeah, the Epstein thing story. I think you should get rid of that picture, man. That's not going to be good in about three months. Well, I, not a take on his situation, yeah. but I have. I'm like, like I have a fucking take on the Epstein thing. I'm sure know, everyone like, does. Sixty forty. I think sixty percent. He probably just killed himself. Um, okay, so he, here's my yeah. apparently controversial take, which is like, it doesn't matter. Like, a suicide that unwatched is murder. Well, every su- you could make a case that almost every suicide in the U.S. prison system, and there's a huge number of them, is murder. Um, I Wait, don't think, but, yeah. but how, what are, do you know statistics about um, prisoners who are of such strategic uh, significance that, like, like never how really often do they before. fail? I, that's, I, this is yeah. arguably the most important arrestee in the history of criminal justice. I don't know how to exaggerate it. Well, here's what I'll say. The His last... suicide watch failing is he murder. He wasn't on suicide watch. He, 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 was he, not, he, he wasn't on no, suicide he watch? Taken he was, there's, but maybe there's, there's, that was okay, part of the plot. Right, yeah. Maybe all they right. took him off. It's uh, the last time, there, I'll say this, the last time there was a prisoner who was like this high profile was Lee Harvey Oswald, and they didn't do a great job there. <laughs> like it was, wasn't a bang up right, uh, protection his, gig. His was on camera. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. Well, here's the thing. Here's a funny little question to raise about Suicide Watch. Yeah, my neighbor's <laughs> doorbell records my dog taking a shit. What's with these stories that come out from federal penitentiaries of the most notorious? Uh, p- potential witnesses, like, 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 like well, yeah, what, uh, we'll, we'll tell you what happened later. Like, like, wait, you can't put a little the, the, bubble gum the, sized the, the camera. Thing was like, the, the fact that he either committed suicide or was, you know, aced. Uh, it was the day that Ghislaine, uh all of her, like, this tranche of uh, of documents came out about him and her involvement, and that's the day that he kills himself. That's either him going, oh fuck it, I don't want to get involved in this. Like, Steve. I, I, Steve Levy just sent me this link. It's in the New York Times where uh, the staffer on guard duty before it happened. It was like, I was the guard on duty. When my shift ended, a new guard came. I'd never seen him before. I said, what's your name? And he goes, Steve. And I said, Steve what? And he looks around for a second and then said, said jail. Levy. Oh, my sorry. name is Steve Jail. I was tired in that same legit, so Steve I left. Steve Jail? 
That's the person who would have been on guard duty when he died. Steve Wait, Jail. Holy this is, this shit. This is a link from the New York what Times. What the fuck? Holy is that, is that shit. Really from this the is fucking... It says the, that. the Steve, WWF you, you, you like would think, you would, you would think, Do you want to come out and confirm at, this? At, at least hire somebody who went through UCB to come up with a better name. He, he, did, he didn't get that job by taking improv classes. <laughs> That's what it says. That job description said, do you own piano wire? I'm Steve Mafia. Yeah. I'm Steve Murderer. I'm Steve Prison. I I, I don't want to... I want to interject and say, I don't want to make light of a fucking murder because if that's what it is, I also don't want to make light of a suicide if that's what it is. I, 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 but it's so high profile and it's like, there's questions of rule of law here. Like, I just don't understand. Like, when you arrest a guy who has a safe with a bunch of diamonds and a (laughs) passport that's fake and is like an alternate identity in Saudi Arabia and everyone agrees, I have this like... I, I imagine being this guy in a box and going like, fuck, man, I never thought in a million years that Trump would be president because I think he thought he had all his bases covered and was like, if it ever goes wrong with the Democrats, I got every Republican in the world on my side. And then he never foresaw the one thing that would fuck him completely, well, which mean- is the Republican Party being hijacked by so much uh, reality TV celebrity that he's like, ha, I'm in this cell. I've done it before. I'll do it again. I have literally everybody on my, oh shit, everybody? There's not a single person in this world that's going to stop me from being murdered now. I don't know, man. I am, um, like he had, he, he was also pretty deep with, with Bill Clinton. Like, yeah. I, I, that's and, what I'm saying. I think if you boil it down So, so to, was Galen. Galen was yeah. like a very I'm saying tight he with was Clinton. deep with Clinton and Trump and he didn't think Trump would be, would become, he's like, he's like, hey, I, as long as I just keep on, keep this Rolodex up. I, I think you're making not the same mistake he made, but in, in terms of where you're looking here as to his mistake, I think you're making the same mistake he made, which is that he looked at the well, top. That's very flattering. What Thank he you. did not pay attention to were the people at the bottom. And what brought him down was not Trump becoming president. What brought him down was a mix of two police detectives who didn't care that it was the end of their career to follow this case, and a really, really dogged journalist at a local paper in Florida who stayed on the case like a fucking pit bull and would wouldn't let it go. And so that's you've read why, about this. Yeah, that's why fucking Epstein is dead right now. Um, and the story, and this is one of the things that I think is so fucked up about QAnon, is like when people imagine the pedophile conspiracy that they think is at the center of world government, they imagine like five-year-old kids being sacrificed by Satanists in the basement of a pizza place. And the actual conspiracy, that we have a huge amount of documentation, what actually went on is that a bunch of rich powerful people around the world wanted to fuck high school girls. That's the whole conspiracy. They weren't six, they weren't 10, they were usually 15 to 17 years old. That's what Jeffrey Epstein provided. That's what all these billionaires and millionaires and presidents and senators and And members of the royal family wanted, as teenagers. Wondering, like, like, right Right, before... Weird flex, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) Right, Right before, like the day before Jeffrey Epstein kills himself, I, uh, asking friends of mine that were like we all met Glenn and we all hung out with her, and she's quite fascinating and she's a very interesting woman and and like you know multilingual and just like like awesome, like wait like was she totally involved with this and I think like like all this paperwork came out all, all these documents came out like like that would really have affected Jeffrey Epstein and Trump Bill Clinton, uh, the Sultan of Brunei Prince Henry. Uh, all, all, all this shit, it's, it's, and then he's dead. And the well, question- so, that, so so Rob Evans, do you think Occam's Razor says? I mean, Suicide? It, it, this is one of those situations. I think Occam's Razor applies to things that uh, you have some precedent for. I'm not aware of a situation in which a guy who had a sitting president, a former president, the Sultan of Brunei, a member of the royal family, several sitting senators, most of like the... And a guy named Gary Jail checking in to make sure he doesn't kill himself. So like, is it possible... Steve Jail. Steve Jail. (laughs) Get his name right. (laughs) 
Yeah. Sorry, what are you saying? Is it possible he was murdered? Fuck it, of course. He pissed off, like, he, a lot of people had a vested interest in him dying. So yeah, there's a real good chance he was murdered. Is it also possible that a guy who had only ever lived, like, as the richest, one of the richest people in the world, and who, like, was used to having every whim catered to, was broken by a few weeks of prison and just decided to yeah. end it because he couldn't take it? Sure. But, well, but he, I mean, he did it before. He made it before. Yeah. Yeah, but that was a real fucking different story. Well, I mean, it was yeah. a different story, especially now that it turned out this way. He, 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 this he, was, he, he was looking like, at like like pr- basically a life sentence. My and, and thing was about rule of law because if you like now we're all focused on this autopsy, and I'm like, who cares if the autopsy says it? Like, yeah, big F D. Like, remember the, <laughs> the, the, the you could you could go into this guy's cell, and I'm sorry, I'm you. I must be frustrating you, but because I'm like I'm like, whoa, imagine the fucking I'm like the liberal QAnon, but I'm like, you, if you wanted to kill this detainee, like, like it, it is as easy as literally like sliding open a thing on his cell and going like, my name is Steve jail. <laughs> I am never going to come into that cell. Like, you know what to do. Right, that's the thing. I, I, it, it's like, it's like, like, like when he, when a person is in that dire straits, yeah. actively not keeping them from killing themselves is murder, regardless of conspiracy. What, what I think you you might be dancing around um, is that is that like, there was a failure to no, protect no, it's, it's one that, of the most powerful no, no, no. pawns in the that, history of chess. That's not the story. The story is that if you want someone dead and you want them dead by their own hand, the easiest way to guarantee that is make them be a normal a normal prisoner in a U.S. maximum security prison because no. that'll pretty but much he, do the but fucking he, well, job for you. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, he, but he he was in a New York uh, it was jail. it was. He it wasn't was even a, in it prison. It was a New York was, federal was, detention facility. But he was in a. He was like alone he, in a cell. Right, he didn't alone. Have a cellmate. He wasn't. You're, you're almost describing like the threat of being thrown into general pop. I well, get I'm, that. What I'm also describing is being isolated. I, I, if, if I apply my, what I would assume my Occam's razor is to that, is that what you said? Is that he said, "Fuck it." I, I I've been yeah. in, I've been in jail since early July, and I'm looking at being in jail for the rest of my life. And he just said. Uh, the the first moment I'm alone, and it's our I'm gonna... job to keep these people alive. I, I I'm outraged about Jeffrey Dahmer dying in prison. Like I don't. I like there is. So, it's like we have to like call, like like we we have this like attitude about bad people in our society where we're just like lock them away, and I hope they get raped to death, and I hope they die, I hope they kill themselves. Yeah, can, Zach, you gotta beat... Can uh, I, 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 I want to hear MC Steve Jail. No, uh, stop it. Like, Steve no, Jail. No, don't do I it mean, even as a joke. Lock them away. I want to hear can, what you have to say about it. Can I bring this around seamlessly to something yes. that ties it back to the original topic and is also uplifting? Oh, yeah. So I'm in fucking Syria, yeah. and I'm talking to these guys... I, mean, the I, know, I know uplifting when I hear it. Yeah. So I'm talk I'm talking to these guys who have been uh, the, all of these people, men and women, who have like just been dealing with this brutal war against ISIS. And the last survivors of the caliphate, they have in a, a, a prison. Well, it's part prison camp, part refugee camp. There's 71,000 people. Not all of them are ISIS survivors, but a lot of them are. And they've got them locked in this camp, and they're trying to figure out what do we do with them. And one of the first things that happens is they start trying to send a lot of these people back to Iraq because a lot of them are Iraqi in origin or that was their port of entry. And as soon as they send them back, they do it with a bunch of French fighters. And France says, we're not going to take these people. Fuck them. They're not French anymore. And Iraq hangs them the same day. That's just what they do in Iraq. And so far, not so uplifting. (laughs) Not uplifting yet. (laughs) The Rojavan Constitution says the death penalty is illegal. You cannot kill a prisoner under any circumstances. It's not okay. So they stop sending prisoners over to Iraq who are ISIS fighters. Um, and so I'm talking to these people, and I'm trying to understand, because me and my partner, Jake, we both had reported from the fighting against ISIS, and like in my case, at least, I've been shot at by these people. I've also spent hours and hours and hours talking to people who've been tortured and beaten from them, had family members killed. And I'm sitting and like, I start by talking to like one of the women who's planning out their criminal justice system and like trying to build this thing from the ground up to be more equitable than the one in Syria, which is not exactly a super hard story, but like they're trying to like do a better job. And she's like, no, you can't, you can't like, revenge is, is a sign of weakness. And revenge is also something that has been endemic in this part of the world in particular for centuries. And it's part of why we have so much violence is one member of this family kills another and they kill a member of their family. 
what we have to do is rehabilitation. And so like at first I'm talking to this lady who's in like, we're in a nice like office room while she's like dealing with ISIS prisoners and stuff. And I'm like, well, you're used to talking with the press. There's a good chance you're putting on a show for me. So we get down to the ground level, to this actual prison camp where they're keeping all these ISIS detainees, and we start talking to their guards, to these people who have, like I talked to this one woman who was telling me a story about how the day before she'd been with this ISIS bride and her kids, and the bride had knocked her down, and her kid had, one of her kids had bitten her on the arm, and she showed me the bite mark where this kid had like ripped through the skin of her arm with his teeth, and like the other kid had gone off to try to get a gas can to pour gasoline on her before like her other comrades had gotten them off. And I'm like, what do you want to be done to these people? And she's like, the only thing we can do is try to rehabilitate them, is try to treat them well and take care of them and like eventually hope that it gets through to some of them and like particularly get through to their kids because that's all you can do is try to rehabilitate people and be better than the people before because if we just start killing them because we don't think they can be fixed, then we're exactly the same as the Dashis, as ISIS. And then I start talking to the other guards, these like young men with AK-47s about like, what do you think should be done? And they all have the same like, we, we have to try to fix these people. We have to try to help them because otherwise, like this is fucked. Otherwise this whole region is fucked. If we can't get past all this violence, everything is fucked. And for a little bit of like, perspective, when I'd been in Mosul at the end of the fighting, I'd been talking to people who had gotten like, had like fled the city during the fighting against ISIS, and I, I would ask people, what do you plan to do when you get back? And almost everyone's answer was, well, this neighbor of mine went with ISIS, and he informed on me, and that's why I had to leave town, or why my car got taken away, or why I wound up in prison, so I'm going to tell on him to the Iraqi authorities and stuff. And it was like this cycle of violence being perpetuated. And every, all of the Kurds we talked to, and the Arabs we talked to at this camp, who were part of this thing going on in Rojava, were like, you can't fucking do that anymore. It has to stop somewhere, so we're going to try to stop it. And that to me was the most uplifting thing that I saw there. And we spent some time with this group of older women who were like part of a neighborhood council who were doing like the, kind of what cops do in the United States, like the, the civil side of law enforcement. So they were the elected representatives of this neighborhood and they would go around and one of the things they did is when there was a murder, obviously you solve the murder, you try to solve the murder and you try to get the murderer in jail and it's usually pretty obvious who's done it. Um, but you also have to deal with the fact that there's two families that now hate each other. Okay. And so you have counseling sessions between the two families where you try to figure out what the family of the murderer can give the murdered in order to try to set things to right. And you, like sometimes it's months of dealing with these conversations. And at the end of it, they throw a big feast between both of the families and everyone else in the area so that everybody sees this beef getting squashed. So that there's public shame on the side of whoever it is, if another family starts up the vendetta again, then everyone knows they're the ones breaking the peace this time. Wow. And this was like at the undergirding of everything that they've done. And so I'm talking to these old ladies about like the fact these women who had lived 50, 60 years under the Syrian regime, not able to hold a job, not able to have any role in governance, and who are now acting as like their own local government for their neighborhoods. And I asked them, could you ever go back to the way things were before? And they were like, oh no, they'd have to fucking kill us. And later that night, my, uh, my fixer, Chabat, takes us to the graveyard at the end of the day. And that's, um, you can see the graveyard on picture five. And I wanna show that because it's, it's kind of noteworthy. So these are the way they do graves in that part of the world. Every single grave you can see is a garden. So they plant flowers in all of the graves so that like every grave is a sprout of life. And as we're walking through this graveyard, which is all soldiers in this who died fighting the Islamic State, we're walking and we're talking and my fixer Chabat is explaining to us how this justice system works and the importance she believes should be placed on rehabilitation and how you can't just try to hurt people, you can't just kill these people even like though they've you killed your families. Guy. You have to try to keep him alive and rehabilitate him. And right after explaining this, we're walking through this graveyard and she stops at a grave and kneels down and kisses it and says, this was my brother. He died fighting ISIS at the age of 17 in 2014. So like that to me was the thing that was like, hit me like a fucking bullet. Um, that somebody can have an experience like that which should be a generator of so much hate and can in the proper environment and with the proper amount of hope, and with you know an acceptance of the realities of the situation, take from that that things can still be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and literally 
a, a, grow a flower. Thank you all. Wait, give it Jeff, up for Rob, wait, everybody. Jeff, wait. Oh, yo, sorry? <laughs> Levy just texted me again. Steve Jail is fake. It's a hoax. So Steve Jail. Sorry, everybody. Oh, God. <laughs> Steve Jail. Cliffhanger. Hey, Thank yeah, you all yeah. for we'll coming. Give it up Steve for Rob Jail's Evans, right everybody. Rob. Rob Evans. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming. Spencer Crittenden. Thanks, guys. I'm Jeff Davis. Your mayor is Dan Harmon. One more time for Rob Evans. Uh, that's a... Uh, it's a beautiful thing to find uplifting things in a horrible, horrible world. Uh, you know what, tonight? Drive slow and don't take chances. Zach, you got beats? He's playing one. There we are. Give it up for Zach McKeever up there. Did you get any of that? It's a good show.